We're all worked out. Okay. Just one second and we'll get started. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. The meeting is now called to order. Clerk, call the roll. Unmute. You're muted, so. There you go. Mr. Dallahan. <laughs> Mr. Dallahan. I see him, but I can't hear him. Try this. Here. This is Gensimer. Here. Mr. Kravchek. Here. Mr. Moore. Here. Mr. Parzik. Here. This is Rich. Here. The meeting is now open. Adequate notice of the meeting was provided by posting a copy of the time and place on the municipal clerk's bulletin board and mailing a copy of same to the press in the Cape May County Herald on April 16th, 2020. For the record, this work session is held via telephone, uh, video conference via Zoom. Will everyone please rise to salute the flag? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation. One nation under God, indivisible, liberty, liberty and justice for all. So we're going to start today's work session with Mr. Dallahan and public safety. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, Frank. Yes, I can hear you, Frank. Okay. Uh, we start with the court report from with Debbie. Is Debbie with us? I can't hear anything. I'm looking for Debbie. I do not see her. All right. Well, then let's let's move on to. Uh, can you hear me all right now? Yes, I hear you fine, Frank. Yep. Okay. We'll move on to the fire department report, and I'll ask Roger to uh, pick up. Thank you, Mr. Dallahan, members of council, and the mayor. Uh, the report for May for the fire department. Uh, we saw a, a large uptick in our call volume, uh, which is unusual since the COVID-19, we've been really down. We, were, we had 34 fire calls with it for the month, uh, 46 EMS calls, both are up from the previous year. Uh, the calls included one building fire, five cooking fires, one mulch fire, one dumpster fire, four medical assists, one watercraft rescue, one hazmat condition, three natural gas leaks, six arcing wires, one cover assignment and nine fire alarms. And that is my report. Roger, there's a um, resolution for a new vehicle for the fire department. Can you please uh, tell us the mileage of the vehicle being replaced and how old that vehicle is? I believe the truck being replaced is a 1994 pickup. Um, this is a uh, uh, an addition, we were already approved the vehicle, but the vehicle we approved, I think, I believe it was in March. Uh, we couldn't get because they needed a new, a new engine. The Chevy has not started making the engines and the engine on the quoted vehicle is not available. So we're uh, getting rid of that purchase order was approved in March and we are now approving a new purchase order with a new motor. So it's not two vehicles, it's just one vehicle for this year, which was already approved in March. Okay. Very good, thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, yes, let's move on to the police department. Um, Tom, are you on? Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, we had one arrest in the month of May. Uh, an update on personnel. We began our full-time uh, police officer selection process last week with an application uh, process, that was, process that was opened. Uh, the applications are due July 1st. And our goal is to have the person that is chosen uh, to start the Cape May County Police Academy in the August recruit, recruit class. Uh, since I last spoke to you, uh, we did have our, our class one recruits begin the academy and we will have them back at work sometime next week. They graduate next Tuesday, which is a, a welcome thing for them to, to be here. Uh, they'll, they'll start work right away. Uh, in terms of COVID compliance that I kind of spoke about last month as well, um, once again, I gave you a, a pretty good report last month with the compliance and I'm, I'm pleased to provide you with the same positive type of update. There's been an overwhelming majority of compliance during the month of May. And those that did need a small reminder of, uh, of the executive orders, uh, once they were reminded of, of what we needed to do, they made the necessary adjustments, which was, which was great. Uh, in that respect, even though we're not out of this crisis yet, uh, up till now, on behalf of the entire police department, I'd like to thank, thank all of our merchants for their cooperation during this difficult time. Uh, we certainly recognized and empathized with their, their individual situations and on their end, they understood we had a job to do. Uh, this mutual understanding has thus far resulted in the fact that we have yet to have to issue a, a summons for an EO violation, which is great. Uh, and I'd just like to uh, say thank you to the entire business community for that, uh, along with Maggie Day and Marnie Langle from the Chamber of Commerce uh, for their, their work and constant communication with me uh, relating to these executive orders. Uh, that's pretty much all I have, if you have any questions. Uh... Okay, Tom, thank you very much. Anybody have any questions? No questions. Okay, let's move on. <coughs> Excuse me, let's move on to the Beach Patrol and Sandy Basako. Sandy. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, the Beach Patrol started guarding the beaches over Memorial Day weekend on uh, Saturday the 23rd. Uh, on Sunday, May 24th, we held our annual lifeguard tryout. Uh, we had a strong turnout. 17 candidates were selected, and they're currently undergoing the rookie training. Uh, the training consists of uh, things like running, rowing, swimming, rescue drills, CPR, first aid, AED training. Um, we haven't had many issues with... Uh, social distancing problems on the beach. Most people are aware and seem to be complying. Uh, we will be adding four extra stands to the beach this summer to help out with spreading out the crowds and the swimmers. Uh, one last subject uh, that we discussed in a management meeting um, was the use of anchoring devices on beach umbrellas because they they blow down the beach whenever there's a strong wind and it, it poses a safety hazard. Um, I think that the use of some kind of a, a tether or an anchor should be at a minimum communicated to the public and possibly considered and discussed for, uh, for an ordinance. And that's all I have. Okay, Sandy, thank you very much. Um, is Debbie on yet for the court report? I guess we'll forego that. Uh, the one note that I have is that there is a proposed increase in fees of a dollar for the borough motor vehicle uh, violation to cover a state imposed fee. And I think that will be discussed later. Is that resolution, Frank, at the regular meeting for us to, that's I not passed? I didn't see it, Mayor. Okay. So, well, okay, then it's something that we would be approving in two weeks, I would assume then? Okay, and then maybe we can get um, an explanation, more of an explanation from the court before the resolution comes forward. It's something that is state imposed that it's my understanding that it's Debbie's recommendation 
that that dollar fee get added to borough uh, ordinance vehicle violations, I believe, in order to cover that state imposed fee. But I'm not, I'm not 100% sure how that would work. So, Mayor, this is Bob Smith. Maybe I could step in. Um, for some reason, Debbie left for the day. Maybe there's some miscommunication. Um, the state of New Jersey with Title 39 offenses has imposed an extra $1 uh, fee to any uh, Title 39 offense, uh, which is traffic, uh, traffic statute. Uh, the purpose of the fee, I believe, is to fund certain DNA uh, efforts and measures and testing uh, of certain criminal defendants, even though they're imposing it on uh, traffic violators. And so Stone Harbor was presented with two options. One is you can keep your fine the same, but we're still taking a dollar from you. And that's the state saying to Stone Harbor, we're taking the dollar. So your choice is you're gonna come up short $1 or you can pass that cost along to our defendants, mostly those that are charged with parking offenses because uh, for the most part, because of preemption, um, you know, vehicle offenses are limited to traffic in Stone Harbor and most municipalities. So that's really the essence of what is going to be considered. It is something that will come up next meeting. Um, and I do apologize for not jumping in a little bit quicker, but I couldn't figure out how to turn off uh, my mute button. Now though, <laughs> I, I had the same problem as uh, Councilman Dalhan. <laughs> So is that then whatever we have to do, we can do by resolution, and it would be a resolution to increase certain fees by a dollar? What would we, what action do we have to take on this? Yeah, it would be by resolution. Um, and, you know, one of the concerns was, oh my God, we're going to have to do a lot of new printing. Uh, but we have a system with, with uh, citations. We use stickers. So when the fines change, we just simply slap on a new sticker, that shouldn't be a problem. And we can adopt uh, the new, you know, dollar fee uh, or fine increase by resolution. The state did it, of course, by statute. We impose that in the municipal court because we're required. And we just change everything by, uh, you know, using the stickers. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, that's all for public safety. Hey, Frank. Yes. Are we going to discuss this uh, uh, beach umbrella anchoring uh, at this time? I mean, if we're going to if we're going to enact something, uh, you know, it takes time to do it. So I know in the public safety committee meeting, everyone seems to be in favor of that. Um, are we going to discuss that now, or we or what? We can discuss it now. I'm in favor of it. I think it's a good idea. And I know um, Josie was in favor of it. Yeah, I'm right uh, here and I agree with you, Frank. I think it's something that we should start to work on and hopefully someone else has a ordinance that we can sort of, um, you know, set the example with. And I think I can offer a little insight too. Um, Mr. Smith asked me to research this a little bit to see um, what other jurisdictions, if any, uh, within the state of New Jersey, as well as others have um, done this. I believe it was last year um, legislation was introduced um, to require anchoring of beach umbrellas to prevent them from blowing down the street. As you know, people have actually been killed by it. Um, and it looks like that legislation stalled in committee and was again reintroduced, I believe in February. I can't find, I was unable to find any local municipalities that have done it. It doesn't mean that it hasn't happened um, in the state of New Jersey. However, in Delaware, uh, they do have ordinances to that effect um, that require people who have beach umbrellas to have them secured. And when we talk about, for the public that may or may not know, when we talk about securing them, it's the, the corkscrew devices that you screw onto the bottom of the umbrella and that uh, safely secures them into the, uh, into the sand. Uh, I, I do think it's necessary, uh, especially with the social distancing that's going on on the beaches, you do see people seem to be much more spread out now. Um, whereas before, when people are right on top of each other, a beach umbrella doesn't tend to get very far. But I personally uh, witnessed two weeks ago an umbrella made it at least 20 or 30 yards before somebody was able um, to get a hold of it. And um, 
I just don't feel like as a borough, we should wait for the state uh, to take action here. I think it's an opportunity for us to, to kind of lead from the front on this one. <clears throat> I agree with you. I think it's a good idea. Reese, Charles, do you have anything to say on this? No, I agree. It seems like a very good idea. Okay. Charles? Seems like a good idea. Uh, the only question I have is in from an enforcement standpoint, how I guess it really only gets enforced when there's a violation and, a, and an umbrella starts going down the beach. Would that, what are you envisioning, Frank or Josie, in terms of enforcement or implementation on a, you know, from a logistical standpoint? I think that would be up to a, the lifeguard on the particular beach to um, call in the uh, police to uh, cite the person who uh, allowed the uh, uh, umbrella to roll down the beach. I don't know how it, else you could do it. I, I think too, this, it kind of reminds me a lot of the ordinance that we passed, uh, the no wake zone. Um, the 9500 block of Third Avenue was a problem and it wasn't necessarily that we wanted to have um, you know, our law enforcement officers out there writing tickets. What it did do, a big thing is it allowed us to create a public relations campaign to kind of get the word out there uh, and have people become informed. One of the things that I did note that is contained in the legislation that was pending in the state of New Jersey, or it could be the actual ordinance in Delaware, uh, that requires um, businesses that sell beach umbrellas to have some type of signage that indicates that they're necessary. Again, I don't feel like we're gonna to have to have the police up on the beach checking umbrellas, um, but what it does do is it kind of creates a public relations thing. A lot of people have no idea that these things even exist and it, it's kind of comical to watch them put their umbrellas in when they, they're not sure what they're doing. Uh, and I hold my breath because I know it's only a matter of seconds before it goes blowing down the beach. Um, but, and also it, it can create liability for people that if they're not being responsible and they don't have you know, their, their umbrella is secured and somebody were to be injured, um, it, it can create a liability for them. Um, yes, and we also talked about the idea of starting what once we decided for doing a resolution like this, that we let the, um, our beach concession stands try to help set an example, have them have them there, even if we have to approve that they can sell them. They rent umbrellas. And I think that if people that go up to rent umbrellas are going to set the example and the beach concession people are going to have that um, the item with them, that's a beginning. I don't think we're looking to arrest people or I think we're looking to try to create it a safer environment and word of mouth. I mean, the stores in town could be told and that's the way I was looking at it. Well, <clears throat> the end result is we'll, we'll have a lot more umbrellas with anchoring devices than we do now. So it's a step in the right direction. So if we have consensus, by and large, we ought to move forward with this, Mayor, at the next... Uh... Well, first we need somebody to find an ordinance and see what fits here and draft it um, to fit Stone Harbor. I would... Um, I always caution anything where the enforcement lies on the beach patrol because we don't want them looking anywhere but out into the ocean. So I'm always a little wary of anything that puts the onus on the beach patrol of anything happening behind them. Um, I prefer that they, they keep their sights looking forward. Um, I do, I, I see what, what you're saying, Ray, makes sense. It would be more than we have now. It definitely would be more than we have now. I do see enforcement being an issue. I'm, I'm always a little wary of creating ordinances, which then are either difficult to enforce or just simply on the books, so to speak. Um, an educational campaign certainly makes sense. And something, you know, you like signs, we can, you know, there'll be some sort of signage even or something like that, I think is a good idea with the educational campaign. But I mean, that being said, we can take a look at some uh, some sample ordinances, but the enforcement's going to be difficult. And um, that's the, I always get concerned when we have ordinances that have enforcement issues and are just, you know, they become a little bit onerous that way. So let's take a look at some samples and see what, what they look like. Well, I think, I do think that the, um, 
lifeguards would be the first ones contacted in the event that a uh, um, an umbrella got loose and possibly injured somebody. They'd be the ones that um, would be the first um, ones to receive a report of such uh, an injury. Right. And then from there, they would call the police. And I agree with you that their job is to look out at the sea to make sure swimmers are okay. But uh, they're, they're the ones that have the direct contact with the uh, police department. And in an event, an unlikely event that that would happen, uh, that's how I see it would go. Just a personal story. I had that anchor screwed in, it got loose, and then it was a pointy metal object at the end of the umbrella flying down the beach. I did have it, I, I had the, I was called it the screwy thing, and I had it in there. So just a little <laughs> personal, I used it in it. So, but anyway, should bring forward um, some ordinances, samples to look at, and we can consider. Okay. So Councilman Dalhan, it's Bob yeah. Smith. So JT and I did some research. We were unable to find, uh, as he said, any other ordinances. However, uh, there's legislation in the Assembly and Senate. And I think what you could do is just simply take the language contained within the Senate and Assembly bills. And Mark can use that language for the drafting of an ordinance. I can forward that to him, but I don't think there was any other ordinances that we found, right, JT? Uh, that's correct, Bob. I, I went through the, um, the E-code, the 360 online, and, and checked as many of the municipalities, a few per county, uh, and I couldn't find any. Um, I'm not sure if they are all aware of the proposed legislation, but the legislation doesn't appear to have much traction. It seems to stall out in committee. Uh, I think with all the things going on, it, it would be a good opportunity um, for us to maybe get out in front of it. I, I think at some point, because the number of injuries that occur, it, it may become state law. Um, but I think this would kind of give us an opportunity to get out in front of the state a little bit um, on the issue. But there is legislation, and I believe it's Rehoboth Beach, um, where they are required in Delaware. That was as best I could find. We can look at a copy of what they have. Yeah, and, and truthfully, the language contained within the state legislation, the proposed legislation, uh, is pretty good language, I think. We could use that for an ordinance. Okay. Good. So it's been my experience, and I don't know if this is worth considering, just thinking out of the box here a little bit, that the primary reason, and perhaps JT and Mayor and anyone else with experience in this area can weigh in, in my experience that when they fly away, it's for lack of depth in digging that umbrella into the sand. Does that sound accurate to everyone? I, 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 I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, because then there's angling, there's an art to put in an umbrella in the beach. And, and I know that some, one of the parts of the legislation that got changed was it was when the wind was over a certain miles per hour right. um, and we don't want to get into any anything like that and i understand mayor i'm with you i hate having to legislate behavior i mean there's a lot of things that we're not allowed to do on the beach and the lifeguards are tasked with that and i i just it really kind of caught my attention because everybody was so spread out on the beach that this could become a problem um, whereas normally when it's densely packed they just don't go very far um, but with people being spread out on the beach, it's just, it was just a, kind of a fleeting idea I had. And, and I do remember there have been fatalities uh, as a result of this. So, um, and a public relations campaign would definitely help. Um, but I, I think unless you actually require it, a lot of people might just disregard it um, altogether, so. Okay. Anything else, Frank? No, that covers um, my report, uh, okay. Mayor. Okay. Um, and for those who are looking at the agenda, um, the fire chief was going to discuss the number of paid firemen needed in the 2021 budget, and he's going to defer that to the next work session of the fire department. Um, moving on, then, Mrs. Gensimer, Recreation and Tourism. 
Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council. Uh, the Beach Recreation and Tourism Committee met on Friday, June 5th, and uh, I'm first uh, going to have Tina Prickett bring us up to date on the ever-changing environment of rec activities. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. Um, so our pickleball and tennis courts are now operating at 100% capacity. Uh, reservations are no longer required, but strongly suggested as they fill up quickly. The app that we are using for all court reservations is Court Reserve. It is working great, and it's a good tool that helps us with crowd control. Um, it's very easy to view what courts are reserved and which ones are available at any given time to avoid people coming in person and that who want to play last minute. Um, our pickleball and tennis facilities are open and staffed 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. seven days a week. Um, our basketball courts are now open to the public with the following safety restrictions. You must bring your own equipment and you can only play with the people that you have arrived with. Stone Harbor Recreation will not be organizing any basketball league play at this time. We continue to closely monitor executive orders and will reevaluate and update any one of any changes. Uh, all three of our playgrounds remain closed at this time as well. Um, I had the opportunity to closely review new executive orders with fellow administration and with the approval of Mayor and Council, the following outside contractors will be able to provide summer programming this month. Surf camp, Zumba classes, yoga on the beach, sandbar, power yoga, and drop and chop cooking classes. The following outside contractor camps will be able to start uh, as July 6th. So we have steel soccer camp, powerhouse field hockey camp, exit zero lacrosse camp, short shot camp, short shot basketball camp, chess camp, and just, just breathe yoga adult camp. Um, in addition to the outside contracting summer programming with close review and creative planning, we will start our recreation department sports clinics and arts and crafts programming July 6th. And they will run for six weeks until August 13th. So that is one week more extended than what we've done in the past. So ultimately we're only losing one week programming due to COVID, uh, which, is, which is really great. Uh, we will be designating different drop-off locations around the field where the rec counselors will meet their clinic participants in order to ensure that social distancing is enforced during the drop-off times. Uh, we have portable hand sanitizing stations and it is encouraged to, that they bring their own equipment where applicable. Any equipment used will not be shared between participants and in efforts to help participants differentiate between the equipment assigned. Uh, the rec department, we have purchased a variety of different color balls. So if you're assigned a red ball for that clinic, that is your ball and you are to not touch anybody else's ball. So it's just a little bit easier than numbering it because I feel like you number it, you can pick it up and say, oh, this isn't mine. And then it changes too many hands. So I felt the easiest way to do this would be to get just different color balls and they are assigned that ball per clinic. Um, and as they continue in the weeks, you know, the yellow ball might be their ball for the rest of the summer. <laughs> so uh, that just helps, it helps the counselors to um, kind of differentiate, make sure that the kids aren't changing equipment um, and everyone is kind of uh, on the same page with that. Um, and then also any equipment used will be sanitized by staff concluding each clinic. We have two Royobi uh, defogger machines. We have the anti-bacterial uh, solution, water-based, um, so everything will be clean at the uh, concluding all the clinics. Uh, property owners will be able to register June 22nd and non-property owners will be able to register June 29th for the start of July 6th clinics. That's great. That's great to get that back up and running. Now we got to get that information out there so people know. Absolutely. They can start to register. Absolutely. My staff is very great. anxious and happy to be able to provide another summer of service for everybody. Good, good. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, next, uh, we have Jenny Olson, who's going to give us an update on tourism and the public information department. Hi, everyone. Um, this weekend, we are going to start our farmer's market, finally, um, with 27 vendors. Um, they're all returning vendors from uh, last year. Um, there are some restrictions, though, that we do have to follow as well. Um, the market is going to be run kind of like a like a like an essential store. Um, there will be a single entrance point on 95th Street. Um, we are going to have some signage on around the market that's that's going to ask people to enter on 95th Street. 
Um, we will have to regulate the number of people who are allowed in the market at any one time. This weekend, we're going to start with 100 people. That's what we're allowed. But the good news is after the 22nd, that number goes up to 250. So I think only the first weekend is where we're, we're going to have an issue with um, the capacity. Um, all the vendors and this, their staff are required to wear gloves and masks um, and required to maintain sanitized sites. And anyone that wants to enter the market is going to have to wear a mask as well and practice social distancing. We are gonna have our annual ribbon cutting to start the market. It's gonna happen 8 a.m. on Sunday, right as the market opens. We're trying our best not to draw a crowd or prevent anyone from proper social distancing. Um, everyone, uh, the council was invited, anyone that can make it, um, we'd like to see them there. Don't forget to bring a mask. Um, and then I also started a separate Facebook page specifically for the farmer's market. And that is up and running right now. Getting, I think we have over 100 likes already. We just started it today. So that's uh, uh, all our vendors um, will have the opportunity to post um, on that site as well. Um, Good idea. As far as um, the Arts and Crafts Festival, I've started the process, of re the process of refunding the vendors who had already paid their site fees prior to our cancellation. It's about 39 vendors. Um, and just so you know, we did not spend any money on the Arts and Crafts Festival prior to canceling. Um, additionally, right now I'm still, you know, constantly updating the website and social media with any COVID related news, um, along with that FAQ document. Um, I've also reformatted our borough newsletter so it can be physically mailed as well as emailed. It was, um, we created a, a new format um, basically to get borough information to year-round residents who aren't comfortable with accessing the internet for information. So um, a limited number of these hard copy newsletters will be mailed out tomorrow. They'll only go out to people who live year-round in Stone Harbor. That's so only about 300 copies. But the digital version will still be posted online and emailed to our entire subscriber list. And that is pretty much everything I have. Jenny, how many less vendors at the farmer's market will we have this year? Five. Five less. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jenny, do you want to give a little bit more information about the Facebook page and the fact that um, our residents can ask questions of the vendors and it'll, it's, it's interactive? Sure. I, I have it. Um, I have it right now where Anybody can post. Um, right now, I have to review all those posts before they go up. Just I want to see how people uh, behave at first. Um, we want to make sure that only our vendors are posting. I don't want vendors from other markets uh, putting posts out there, basically, like you know, taking people away from our market. Um, but so someone can post, but I'll have to just review it before before it goes up there. Um, and it's just Stone Harbor Farmers Market. If you look for it on Facebook, just look up Stone Harbor Farmers Market. There is another one out there. One of our vendors has it. I'm trying to get to him to change the name um, of his. Um, we already have more followers than him, so he hasn't used it in a couple of years. So I don't think he'll be posting. Thank you very much. Now, as far as the, the, the number of people who can come through the farmer's market, any number can come through, correct? We just cannot have 100 there at the same time. Yeah, we're not, well, I mean, that's, it, it is an out, it's outside. They're recommending about 100, as long as people are properly social distancing. Um, so I have a counter, well, you know, we'll count as people go in and- as Okay. Because we'll, we'll I was thinking as they come in, you know, as long as you don't have 100 there at any given time, like a supermarket, if we're handling it, you know, like a supermarket, you just keep people moving. Um, Cause I, I would hate, I, that means we would only allow 25 people per hour. And that's not a lot of people. No, it's a hundred at any one time. At any one time. Okay. Just wanted to make sure that people are aware. Okay. They're going to be cycling through the entire time. Okay. okay. Which I mean, I think is, is going to be okay. I mean, at this week will be the, a little bit harder um, once it goes on the 22nd that number goes up to 250 so right you know we missed that by a day but okay. um, as long as they're you know yeah. social distancing and 
uh, and we've moved a couple people around that tend to, uh, you know, have some lines at their sites. So hopefully, yeah. you know, people won't be congregating in one area in a line. Okay. Um, I, I think, you know, I think it's, you know, this, this weekend is going to be a little bit of a test. We'll see, see how it goes. But um, okay. I, I mean, I think we're, we're ready for it. I think we're, I think it's going to be fine. Yeah, I think it's going to go well. Anything else for recreation and tourism? That concludes our report, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. Natural resources, Mrs. Rich. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I don't see pictures because I'm not looking, but I'm hoping that Dr. Stu Farrell is out there. Um, he is going to give us a report on our beach. And um, if he's out there, go for it, Stu. I did see him. Let me look for him. All right. Um, I figured out how to unmute it. There you are. Okay. Um, the report was submitted back in May um, to the administrator and uh, basically beach nourishment took place in 2017 with uh, 320,000 yards derived from Townsend's Inlet and 394,000 yards pumped from Hereford Inlet by the state of New Jersey for a total of 714,000 placed on the uh, municipal oceanfront. Uh, in 2019, the maintenance effort was uh, essentially <clears throat> avoided by virtue of the fact that the only plan they had at the core was to mine the dunes to put sand on the beach that was in the dunes. And you all decided that that was kind of a lame exercise in the fact that why would you do that, and especially where they were going to take it as some of the best dunes along the Cape May County shoreline. So. We compared October 2019 with um, April of 2020, and adding up the eight sites from 82nd down to 123rd Street, each profile is centered in between the groins that define that beach cell. We came up with 380 yards net gain over the winter, <laughs> overall, both onshore and offshore. Um, the year before, we found that there was a huge gain onshore matched by a very large loss offshore, uh, but there was still a positive gain on the beach. Uh, this year, uh, the gain on the beach was about 25,000 cubic yards, and the loss offshore was uh, 24,600 yards. So the net was 380 yards to the good uh, across the entire oceanfront shoreline. Um, the report is available. I would assume you, you guys have it. Um, if you want, I can share the screen and show you some of the pictures if you want. I would say go for it. All right. Um, let's see, which screen do I share? Um, <laughs> um, show all windows and uh, share computer sound. All right, there we go. Uh, do you... Um, all right, do you see that? Yeah. Uh, that's uh, 82nd Street. And I'll scroll through it. This is the cross sections in 82nd Street. And you can see the dune is in fine shape. There's an offshore bar that uh, developed um, in that uh, segment. Uh, the black line is the most recent survey. The red line is the October survey. The other two are from the year previously. Uh, this is uh, 90th Street. Again, the dune toe has some debris washed up over the winter, but no damage to the dune toe whatsoever. Uh, that profile is uh, rather little change. Some sand was blown into the dunes, but not much changed offshore. The bar uh, in uh, October flattened out considerably by April. And so therefore that's the source of the loss at that uh, particular site. Moving south to 95th Street, uh, we're looking south from the uh, handicap ramp, and you can see sand blown up into the dune fencing. Again, uh, storm debris at or near the dune toe, but uh, no damage to the dunes themselves. Again, bar diminution offshore, beach gains on the shore. Uh, 103rd Street is the narrowest beach, or no, it's 108th is the narrowest, 
Um, but this one again shows uh, the sand fence is almost buried, right? There's a little bit of it showing and sand has been moved into the dunes. Again, bar diminished offshore. And there's the 108th Street Beach, which is the narrowest one in the borough. Uh, storm waves had reached to the dune toe, but again, no uh, losses to uh, the dunes themselves. Uh, moving south, you can see this profile is a narrower beach. It's a slope into the ocean that happens fairly quickly. Uh, so this is the narrowest one in the borough. And then you come to 112th Street where things change very dramatically to the largest dunes in town uh, with multiple dune ridges and enormous amounts of sand uh, moved into a dune that is now uh, pretty much uh, one of the best in the state of New Jersey. And 116th Street, similar situation, very wide dunes, very wide beach, accumulating sand in this case, um, and about uh, eight or nine cubic yards per foot was added to this site. And you can, you have a multiple dune ridge here, it's 116th Street, and the fairly wide beach with a gentle slope to the ocean. Then the surprise was here at 123rd Street, which is where the uh, kayaks get moored. But last year, there was a vertical scarp, scarp cut into this as the sand was cut back into the dunes. Um, wind blew sand up here, and the beach became wider uh, by a number of feet. As you can see here, the black line shows sand moving onto the shore, replacing some which was lost. So um, this... Uh, was one of the remarkable gains because usually when losses occur, they occur here and the sand moves onto the spit at South Point. So basically that was the summary. Uh, it makes for better reading than it does scrolling through and showing it, but uh, um, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's what I have to share with you. And uh, I said, if you need a copy, uh, Kim Stevenson will get it to you if you ask her, I'm sure. I think it's easier to, to listen to it than to read it. So it makes a whole lot of sense. Does anybody, any council members have any questions? Josie, my question has to do with whether Dr. Perro has an update on Hereford Inlet. Well, I wish I did. Um, I asked uh, uh, Mr. Waldron in Avalon whether or not the agencies had responded to Secretary Bernhardt's letter last fall where he said it was okay to take sand out of Hereford Inlet. And uh, he said that is so far that the, the national offices of the, um, the uh, Society for Birds, uh, Audubon, Audubon's national, not New Jersey Audubon, but National Audubon was raising holy hell about it because they didn't want this to be the story for every CDF, uh, you know, uh, CR, uh, CBRC in the nation. And the other one was coming from, um, uh, what was it, National Wildlife Foundation. They were opposed to the letter and said this was the Trump organization selling out more natural areas for the gain of the wealthy on the beach. Um, it didn't change his letter. And so far as I know, um, the Army Corps is, has a copy of it and is con figuring out how to manage working into using federal money to pump Hereford Inlet sand onto Stone Harbor or uh, North Wildwood. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Waldron can be probably reach directly at uh, his Avalon office. Any other questions? That's a good answer. Thank you. Yeah, I do. Dr. Farrell, the, uh, the, the loss of those offshore uh, dunes or bars, how, yes. how does that bode for the borough moving forward? Is that, well, is that a bad omen or is that to be expected? Well, you got sand from Avalon last winter uh, at 82nd and 90th Street as sand moved south from Avalon into Stone Harbor. And the sand on, the, on those offshore bars migrated onto the beach in large measure, 
uh, which is why the beaches were positive by 25,000 yards and the offshore was negative by 24,700 yards. Uh, so there was a basically a cross shore shift. Sand offshore moved onto the beaches and was not replaced from offshore further because there were no real storms last winter. There was one storm in late uh, March and then we had some northeast just last weekend. It was northeast 20 knots for Saturday and Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. The waves were three to five foot and so I'm sure sand got transported by those events too, but nobody takes any account of those kinds of minor northeast days. Although we've been conscious of them with the nuisance flooding stuff we've been doing, that things happen even on those kinds of northeast winds. So the the loss of that the loss of that sand offshore. I'm just trying to understand. Does that mean we lost protection in future storms? Not really. Um, the bars only uh, slow the wave down somewhat. The wave ultimately either if the wave's big enough to break on those offshore bars, um, you're going to have a situation where the bar itself is going to be mobilized into a sand slurry by the wave action, and so the effect on the beach is gonna be the same no matter whether the bar was there or not. If the waves don't break on the bars, then they're there. Uh, they don't do much to slow them down because the wave didn't break. Anybody else? Okay, thank you so much for joining us. It is a pleasure always to hear it from you. All and, right, well. uh, Thank you have you. a good you have a good safe summer and we'll we'll stay in touch. All right, we'll do. I'll uh, depart and let you do the rest of your things <laughs> together. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Um, Judy, the only other thing is that I wanted people to know that the bird sanctuary trails that are usually open are open now, and that we do have the stewards down at the point, and that's going to be the end of our natural resource report for today. Okay, thank you. We have a couple of items for discussion and actually the first one is a lot grading ordinance and it has a particular item within the ordinance that Councilwoman Rich has asked to be discussed as well. So what I'm going to do is introduce the planning board engineer Paul Cates to discuss the um, Lot grading ordinance, and then from there we can move into the second item of discussion, which is it's an item within the lot grading ordinance. So good, cool. good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, these lot grading changes began life at the flood mitigation committee, and once decided on there, they were then sent to the planning board for discussion and then ultimate recommendation to council. Um, the final approval and recommendation was at our last planning board meeting with a few changes which are still being worked on, uh, but we figured we would introduce it here and get, get it ready. Um, the planning board discussed and agreed with all of the recommendations with the exception of one, uh, which we will get to. The first change uh, is to reduce the impervious coverage in every residential zone by 15% and allow for a 15% of semi-pervious coverage in order to reduce runoff uh, to the roads and, and to our storm system. Uh, one issue with writing this into the ordinance is there's no, currently there's no universal standard for defining uh, the way paver companies handle pervious pavers impervious areas. So the way it is written, it's going to put the onus to, to propose something by the builders and their engineers when they do these lot grading plans and then follow through on them. Uh, the second change is that we're going to now apply the lot grading requirements to all new construction, substantial improvement, as well as site plans and subdivisions. Uh, previously, site plans were not included in the requirements of the uh, current lot grading ordinance. Um, the third requirement that we're changing is we're increasing the underground storage. Essentially, uh, the, the system that's currently in use is going to be doubled going forward. And um, 
The fourth, the fourth change in this ordinance, which is the one contested change, was uh, they, the planning board decided to put limits on irrigation in the grass strip. Uh, sprinkler irrigation will no longer be allowed. If you want to irrigate your grass or vegetation in the grass strip, you'd be required to do it with drip irrigation. The recommendation coming out of the flood mitigation committee was to eliminate all forms of irrigation in this area, as well as vegetation, including grass. And the requirement would be to put in some sort of stone mulch um, or, or something other than um, grass, with the exception being paver, pavers or hardscaping because they would increase the impervious coverage. Um, the fifth requirement that we're working on is to in low-lying areas of the borough, ultimately with sea level rise, we're going to need to raise the elevation of the roadways. Uh, in order to do that and not negatively impact uh, the homes and the lots, we need to start raising those lot grades um, to enable us in the future to raise road grades. So the fifth requirement that we're looking at is requiring retaining walls along property lines and a minimum grade elevation that all of the property lines would be required to be brought up to. Um, this way down the line, uh, we'll be able to raise roadways. Um, and then along with, with these changes, we're also looking at some regulatory issues that uh, the borough engineer Mark and Ray Poudrier are dealing with, with regard to retaining walls and some of the other things. And I think Mark had a few comments with respect to the retaining walls. Okay. Thanks, Paul. So I guess on the ground as we're implementing this, so some, some issues have popped up. And since the borough was considering revising the ordinance, we thought we would bring this to your attention. So in uh, section 560-50A4, it reads like this. <clears throat> Retaining walls installed in slope controlled areas shall be constructed of reinforced concrete or other reinforced masonry or of another construction acceptable to the borough engineer. And it goes on to talk about shall be designed by a New Jersey licensed engineer, et cetera. So <clears throat> we have had a couple of instances where applicants have been proposing uh, timber retaining walls, timber retaining walls that are wrapped in vinyl and some other materials. So from a functionality standpoint, those materials could do their job. Um, but the complaints that we have gotten from adjacent neighbors are the aesthetics. So not knowing <clears throat> if there was any discussion at the planning board level relative to the intent behind any aesthetic consideration, we just want to bring this to your attention in case you want to address this component of it, was is the intent to have it to be decorative concrete decorative segmented retaining walls, or is any material that they submit that functionally works, is that acceptable? Because it gives me the latitude to approve that, and I don't want to approve materials that may not be in alignment with what the borough believes in. So I was looking to see if we could get some direction or some conversation on that from the borough, and if that warranted any change, since we're changing the ordinance, we could you know, kill that bird too. To answer your question concerning the planning board, there was no discussion mm -hmm. at all on what materials would be used for that retaining wall. And I see what, what you're saying is, it, it basically ends up many, many different types of materials could be used and there could be something that you think the borough would not particularly want to be used as part of a retaining wall, correct? Is that what you're getting at? Correct, yeah, we had one come in recently. Again, it comes through the construction office as the clearinghouse and the letter basically said, hey, um, we're proposing you know, timber wrapped in vinyl. We feel that this meets the spirit and intent. Uh, the borough engineer has a latitude to approve this and this is what we're proposing. And at that point, I guess that was the maybe the fourth or fifth time we've had to deal with that. And, you know, since you're discussing this ordinance, I just want to bring that up. Do you have any suggestions? Well, depending upon the intent, 
if there is an intent to try to regulate aesthetics, um, this is like colors, right? I may like blue, you may like red. So I wanted to see where council was. Um, some people may like wood retaining walls. You could call it nice and rustic and natural. Some other people may want decorative segmented retaining walls. If I could, can I jump in here, uh, Mayor and Mark? Um, I think um, when we weigh intent with also functionality, I think maybe the, the, the path to head down here is to require number one, which is already, I think, part and parcel of this, that the design be signed off on by a licensed uh, professional engineer. And number two, I think we should eliminate any structure which includes timber because in my experience, no matter how you fasten timber and no matter what timber it is, it's an eventuality that will, that will, it will fail in some form or fashion at some point. So my thinking is that this should be treated um, in a manner in which we build our foundations. Um, CMU block and the aesthetics part of it, I think the level of involvement here dictates that the aesthetics will follow. I don't think you'll find many homeowners going through the trouble of building retaining walls and then leaving them as a unfinished block on the exterior portion of that wall. Um, so I think that is the safer and more prudent direction to head in. And I, I personally would like to see any timber related products removed from, from, uh, from this definition and um, be allowable. And did you say Mark Timber wrapped in vinyl? Yeah, so that was the last, that was the latest thing that came in last week. It's similar to what is used for bulkhead construction where they have to take the timber, wrap it in vinyl to make it non-leaching. In fact, I think it might have been a component from a bulkhead. Um, and they were going to place it up against um, wood posts to retain the, the earth back. So in your opinion, Charles, even if that timber is wrapped in vinyl, same thing? Well, again, the non-leaching component is the functional part that could be, could is acceptable, I guess, on some level. However, that being said, these are, not, it's not, they're not adhered with the masonry product uh, as a true retaining wall built out of CMU block that it, I, I see that as being an eventual uh, failure at some point in some way. I think the safer bet is CMU block. However, maybe, maybe I'm not as familiar with this product and maybe Mark and Paul can shed some light on that. I could be convinced otherwise, I'm, but my experience is solid core foundation with rebars through the footing and that's not going anywhere. So, so the timber wrapped in vinyl is the same kind of product that's used when they submerge uh, bulkhead components in water probably is functional. So then do you have someone complain that they have something vinyl to look at? Again, this is, you know. I know uh, Frank Bowen is on the agenda today. I don't know if he's on here yet, but I know he's here. He's supposed to be on at some point for a doc hearing. And if he is on here, maybe he could add some uh, his uh, input here. Be there. Mr. Bowen, you on? I thought I saw him, but maybe he can't unmute himself. I know while we wait for him, sometimes depending, as in Charles was saying, sometimes depending on how those walls are fastened with the with the fiberglass wrap, the the bolts that they put through them aren't properly resealed, and then while water can actually get inside of that vinyl and kind of rot the wood from the inside. So they may look as good as they did the day they went in, but they can start to fail from the inside out if not properly installed. So that, that could be a potential issue as well. Mm -hmm. I guess my question also is, so assume, assume we have a footing as we normally do. Uh, are, these, are these wrapped uh, timber installed as you would a CMU block where you have rebar coming out of the footing up through that's so structurally to me right they're just stacked correct well what was what was 
submitted to us didn't really have um, details on it. It was a photo of a side yard that showed how it would be installed and it was not installed that way. It would be fastened, I guess, to by four by four posts. Hmm. So then in essence, the only thing offering lateral support from backfill would be the four by four post, which would have some sort of footing underneath of it? Maybe. That again, it, we didn't get a plan on it. It was just shown graphically to say, this is what we're thinking. We think it meets the intent. You have the ability to approve this borough engineer. What do you think? I think, uh, <clears throat> I think I, that I'm glad we're moving forward and starting to look at this, uh, this ordinance. I think there's some things here that, um, needs to be fleshed out some more. And, and with these retaining walls, Charles, you were the one who, who first proposed that they be masonry. And I think you're right. I think you did. That's I correct. I said that quite some time ago. Um, I believe there was a property on 105th Street that Mr. Pudry had brought to the planning board's attention that was attempting to install a retaining wall made out of treated dimensional lumber and you know it was it was uh, if I recall it was a property that was third from the beach new construction and I was kind of flabbergasted that that was what was being proposed to do a retaining wall in the back of the property and yes you are correct that's when I that's when I said this should be probably be masonry you know throughout the borough and, and I, I agree with that, but I, I think uh, some more thought has to go into, you know, like Mark was saying, how, how people may want to finish this. If they're going to finish it with a skim coat on it, uh, are they going to paint it? Some people are going to want to put like sticky brick on it or sticky stone on it. There's a whole lot of different things at work here, you know, so, so we ought to go back to the drawing board and figure out what we're going to allow, what we're not going to allow, not that you want to legislate taste right yeah that's what i was just gonna say i'm not not even sure that we can legislate that mark caravan can shed some light on that but i will tell you my experience in this realm has been since these retaining walls face a neighbor um the i will consult the neighbor and ask them what we are proposing to do if they are fine with that and if they are not fine with that, what would they like to see facing their property? In one instance, we actually offered to match the brick on their foundation. They ultimately changed their mind and we installed AZAC paneling along that wall. So it looked like a shiplap panel to their landscape bed just to accommodate them. So that's my experience. I don't know that we can legislate what you need to do, but Perhaps we need to say, perhaps we can say something that says it can't be unfinished CMU block. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at, at, uh, at Mark and Ray, what they're going to go through going forward in, in, in enforcing this, that they have some kind of guidelines that make sense to them and that they understand. So it's not, you know, you look at something automatically have a question, gee, should I allow this or not, you know? So maybe if that could be fleshed out better. And I also thought about, um, we, we've had some conversations over the past year and a half about oversized uh, lots, like double lots, for example, and um, the size of the structure that can go on it. I mean, maybe it's, this is a good time also to talk about the setbacks on oversized lots that maybe we increase the setbacks proportional to how oversized the lot is, uh, so we can provide more spacing between the that and the adjacent house and some light and air. Because I know I, I've heard comments, and I'm sure you have too, that a lot of people are concerned uh, with the size of some of the houses going up. So if you have that 90 foot lot, maybe we wanna make it a you know, a 15 foot setback or a 12 foot setback, or like I say, graduate it according to the size of the lot under discussion. 
I mean, it's an, it's definitely an interesting topic and I think it's worth considering, but I think also of uh, when you look at some of these lots, you have some of these non-conforming 30 foot lots that are also be get, being given um, variance relief at the zoning board to come within like five feet of a property line. And I'll tell you, you wanna talk about uh, obscuring sight lines, it's, that's a situation which, you know, bears equal um, consideration where you have a 30 foot lot and they're, they're the, the structure, and then you have bump outs on some of these that are being approved that now encroach to like two and a half feet of the property line. So I think we need, this is one of these situations where I think we need to look at the zoning ordinance top to bottom, big lots, small lots, and all those in between. And right now, what's the maximum a house can be is 100 feet, correct? That's correct. And that is even if you buy the lot next door to you. If you buy 260s, you have 120 feet, your house cannot exceed the 100, correct? That's my understanding, Ray Poudrier, correct? That's, that's correct. Okay, okay. But on a 90 foot lot, you can end up having, what are the side yard setbacks, 10 feet? In the eighth, yeah, so 70. So you'd have a 70 foot wide house on a 90 foot wide lot. So that's what Ray Parzik, what you're saying is have some kind of graduated scale. Yeah, huh. exactly. And I don't, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have one to propose. I'm just saying that. Right. If, if, be you know, this fun. ordinance says it's the changes that Paul's uh, or the planning board's recommending. You know, the ordinance does lay out the, the side yard setbacks and front yard setbacks and whatnot. So maybe it's a good time to also do that uh, while we're at it. Okay. And as far, you know, as far as Charles, but what the zoning board, you know, I don't know how you, how you control what they, what they approve. You know, it's people make their case and so be it, I guess. Well, I think you know, control it by ordinance, actually. Yeah, but it, I'm sorry, but isn't the the appeal to the zoning board for variance is an appeal to the zoning law, correct? Right. It, it is, but ultimately if we set, so there's also, and Paul Cates can um, weigh in on this too, when the zoning board routinely grants the same relief I think it's incumbent upon a municipality to actually install ordinances related to these types of situations because it then becomes sort of a perfunctory, um, a perfunctory uh, issue that people have to appear, appear before the, uh, the zoning board to, to, to request such relief. And when it's routinely granted, I think it's incumbent um, upon the municipality to enact legislation consistent with the same well there's there would have been a de facto change in the neighborhood scheme by virtue of the variances and each applicant would have the history of the prior variances as a record so you know ultimately it kind of di diminishes the value of the zoning itself right right it makes sense well we did that we did that on that on the uh with the 55 foot lots. We changed the ordinance, what, last year, the year before to, to uh, remove that onus of having to go to the zoning board to get approval to build. Um, Paul, can I ask you on uh, table two maximum limitations in, in, uh, in, in um, district C or In the, yes. in the C zone, you have, you, you know, you've got a couple of things proposed. Can you just explain to me what the difference is between this and what it was before? Well, th this actually just reflects exactly what was there before with the exception of reducing by 15% that impervious cover. So there's a differing requirement for undersized lots to have to adhere to. They don't get, they get more than the full 70% for the undersized lots, which mostly references the courts, which we're also working on at the planning board. But right now, so it, 
the way that it's written is just to reduce, regardless of whatever that requirement was, we're dropping it by 15%. So you can see it says lot coverage with the semi-pervious would be 85% for lots having an area of 2,200 square feet or less. So it, it increases that 70% threshold. And then as that lot grows, you lose a percentage of coverage for each 200. So the effect is the same as in the other lots. It's just requiring a 15% semi-pervious coverage um, consistent with the, the current ordinance. Yeah, I see. Thank you. No problem. So question going back to the retaining wall. If that, and we'll take this, I think we should do what Ray Farzik has suggested. We can take it back and continue to work on it. But I am curious as to if we remove, is it as simple as removing the words that say or of another construction acceptable to the borough engineer? And if it's just constructive reinforced concrete or other reinforced masonry? Yeah, I think we can change that wording to make it clearer and more definitive. And I mean, with regard to removing at least the timber walls, which seem to be a sticking point at this point, from a functionality and longevity standpoint, I think you can make a case, not necessarily by taste. So that would, we could clear that language up relatively easy. No, I, I, so I would say if, if, the, if the borough definitely does not want to use timber, it should maybe say something or of another non-timber construction or masonry construction, I think we need to be more definitive. So it closes that loop. Okay. So I certainly wouldn't be opposed to uh, in, including masonry as the only available and then also including a design which would be approved and that design would certainly mimic, uh, you know, foundations where you have a footing of, you know, 18 inches by 18 or 18 by 21 and then a uh, block work above it with uh, number, you know, number four rebars coming at 16 inches, you know, every so often on center. So up through continuous. Um, I think, I think if this is the way you want to go, you could simply just insert the word masonry after the word other and that would just cover it. One unintended consequence of requiring only masonry and it may be and intended consequences, you would be cutting out where a lot of times they return the bulkheads down the property line to create some side yard stability in the backyards. And uh, if you require only masonry, then they wouldn't be able to return that vinyl bulkhead, which has been acceptably used in the past. I think that might be an example of superseding our ordinance by NJDEP. So if any bulkhead is installed like that, where there are returns, that does need to appear on the CAFRA NJDEP permit. And as such, it would be permitted. Um, generally, those returns that they approve are no more than two to three feet into the property. And it's usually based on a pre-existing bulkhead that existed in that area at the time. Or if we can get them to actually tie into the other bulkhead without the return, that's preferable. Right. But I don't, uh, my, I guess my point is I don't foresee that being a problem because that's an approved NJDEP permit and as such, and I, I'm, in my opinion, would supersede our ordinance because that has to do with waterfront development rather than, you know, it's it's kind of that gray area in between, but it's a permitted and it's not a retaining wall that comes down the side of the property for any significant length. Um, I have a question. Is there any accommodation for a change in design depending on the height uh, of the actual masonry? Uh, not that this ordinance is crafted. You know, just to bring up a similar situation. So if I build a house right now, and I think, again, I think this sort of takes care of the, the matter from aesthetics, takes care of itself, so to speak. So when I build a house right now, um, whether it's for someone or whether it's to sell, I build my foundation block um, out of CMU block. There's no way on earth I'm leaving it raw like that. It's just 
it's a function of the, the, the nature of real estate here and what you do to maximize value and all of that. So my thinking on this is that no homeowner spending the time, effort, and money to develop a property and put a retaining wall in is going to leave a raw CMU block face um, on it. Not to say it couldn't happen. I could certainly build a house like that right now. I just never would. And nor have I seen anyone do that. So just something to think about. And, you know, in, in Jennifer's question, uh, there is a, uh, there is a paragraph in here that says that the, the retaining walls can't be, can't exceed one third the horizontal distance between the building foundation and the property line. There is a height restriction in there. Okay, thank you. But um, that, that right that yeah, and that also was for the strength of the retaining walls. If you get them too high and you're holding back too much soil and the foundation, it could undermine the foundation. Right, but now that's going to have to work with, and I don't want to you know beat this to death, but it, so you're you have a paragraph here that's saying that the for new construction, we're looking to get lot lot elevation up to 6.5 for 1988. Um, and if we have uh, on on waterfront properties, if we have bulkheads going in at eight feet or being raised to eight feet, depending on on the condition of it. So if somebody builds up to six five with a retaining wall. I mean, that would allow for a, a gradual uh, lot grading out to the street front, or are we going to have to require um, retaining walls across the front of the property? As part of this, that's what we're actually looking at, requiring retaining walls across the front of the properties in order to be able to then in the future bring those street elevations up. And if you received the email yesterday, I did provide two pictures of homes that that have done just that to protect their landscaping and their foundation in an, in low lying areas. So yeah, it would, the intent of this is to basically raise the entire lot, including the front property line with a retaining wall, which may look odd being the first one in a neighborhood, but hopefully as we move oh. forward, there's more and more of these develop, it, you know, it'll it, allow us to bring those road grades up. It's no, it, it won't look any odder than it, the eight foot bulkhead in, in place, uh, you know, along a bunch of five and a half, but we all agreed that that's where we got to go moving forward. So we'll get there eventually. So, so you envision it then as a, as a gradual, um, you know, so we won't need terraces and whatnot in the, in the, uh, in the side yard setback. Yeah, I think it's going to be a gradual slope from the back to the front. You wouldn't be terracing those yards um, due to the fact that you're also raising the front as well. Okay. Right, because conceivably you're going from six and a half at your pro front property line to, let's yeah. say on the bay, eight foot at the bulkhead. Is that, is that, so that differential, let's say across a hundred foot lot, say 10 of it lies in the bay. That's gradual enough that, you know, you're not having to put install steps there if you didn't want to. Right. And I, and I think, you know, there may be some oddball, you know, shapes or cases out there where you got to allow for a step or two to, to make that transition. But in general, we're talking about uh, a gradual slope. Uh, so so part, part of this additional benefit to getting that uh, lot elevation up, and we talked about this with Ray, from the UCC perspective is, <clears throat> if the borough is ever in a position to raise roads, which we have advocated for, we want to make sure that the, the impact to the private property owner is mitigated. So the higher the steps are, the garage floors, the flood vents, the less pain there would theoretically be in the future to make that great adjustment. So those things come along with that minimum lot elevation. I mean, again, if you look at the, if you look at the big picture here, 
the planning board has taken steps and council has followed through on it. It's a natural progression. And when you take a step back and look at the bigger picture, we're on the right path here. We started with, let's get a, our top of block on all these homes across the board in the borough at elevation 11. That means your first floor finished height is roughly 12 on all new construction. Your bulkheads around the perimeter of the bay fronts are all now set to an eight foot elevation. And now we're gonna bring up the grade of the whole entire lot with retaining walls that continue all the way to the front of the property. Now you've established an area of each lot that has to be raised to a new standard and now the, the roadways can follow. So we've really established a firm foundation here looking like we said before last year, or the year before, let's look far down the road and think 30, 40, 50 years out, what we, where we need to be so that we aren't behind the curve, we're ahead of it. And I think we're, we're, we're headed in the right direction here. What elevation are you moving towards for the roads? I think the goal would be to get them in that six to six and a half foot range. So if the, the retaining walls are at six and the yards are at six and a half, you could feasibly put the crown of the road up to six and a half, which would get, excuse me, which would get it well above the uh, kind of nuisance flooding issues and, and smaller storms. Jennifer, to put that in perspective, and maybe I'm saying something that you already know, um, but for the benefit of everyone on here, you have bulkheads in this borough right now, bulkheads that exist between four and four and a half feet. Yeah. And they're supposed to be to eight feet by when? By next year, those, those it's, correct me if I'm wrong, Ray, four to four and a half feet have a year from now to correct their bulkheads? I think they're in their two year window. Yeah, they're, they're, the, in, they're in that second batch. We did the four foot and below had two years and now the four to four and a half are in their two year cycle to- uh, Yeah, the yeah. second group has till the end of 2022, 2021 or 2022? 2022, you're right. I think it's two years from now. So why don't we put it in our ordinance uh, now about uh, trying to raise, um, you know, about raising the roads to six to six and a half feet. So our home homeowners know that we're working towards that. So that's gonna be something that'll be proposed in the storm sewer master plan. And that can be incorporated into ordinance um, as well. That'll, that'll be a, you'll, when we get to that point, we get into the master plan, that's gonna be a heavily recommended uh, flood mitigation technique. Okay, thank you. So we'll have those elements of this ordinance. I guess I'm, who do we task with this? Paul, Cates? Two, but meanwhile, we still have one more aspect of the ordinance to discuss, which would be the grass, um, the grass stripping. Yes. Um the whole um, idea behind this was um, at least a year or so ago, and it was more so for water conservation. Um, I think everything that we're doing about thinking to the future is, is exactly what we should be doing. Um, I'm not sure what plans we have to conserve water, but this was uh, presented a couple of times in different places. Um, that there would not be anything between the sidewalk and the curb in new construction that's going to require any kind of water in the attempt, which might sound a little whatever right now, to conserve water. I think everybody knows how close we got last July um, to using our quota. And we haven't, I don't know that there's a plan out there or plans out there. I know this has been talked about in Go Green. It's been talked about in uh, flood mitigation um, and it seemed to be something that could be a, yes, maybe it's a Band-Aid, but we're going to need more than a Band-Aid in the future while we're thinking about all the rest of this to do something to conserve our water. And I, did I exactly right. well, just so, just to give a little bit of history, Charles, is this, um, this lot grading ordinance was discussed both in the planning board and in the flood mitigation committee 
And then this idea of the no grass or vegetation within the right of way was brought to, and the rest of this ordinance was brought to the planning board. And the planning board, that's the only portion of this ordinance that the planning board could not support. And then I did bring that information back to the flood mitigation committee. And then the flood mitigation committee said, well, we still want it in there. So that was brought back to the planning board. And the planning board said, it, it's something they don't, I should say we, because I'm one of the members on the planning board, we don't support it and for, for various reasons, um, which we I'll articulate after, I don't know what Charles was gonna say, but I just wanted to give everybody the, on council, the benefit of knowing it kind of has gone back and forth and back and forth a couple of times. No, I, and all I wanted to add was I agree with that we need to conserve water absolutely anywhere we can. Um, and the way to do that, I think in this instance and maintain a good balance between people wanting to have um, landscaping and grass in between the curb and the sidewalk is to mandate that um, because everybody's seen the sprinkler systems that 90% of it blows out into the street if it's windy, and that's if it's a good sprinkler that's supposed to just hit the grass, the wind blows it out in the street, and then you have those rogue sprinklers that are not set properly, and they end up throwing, you know, just on their own, a ton of water into the street, and it's completely wasted. So, yes, conserve water, but the I think the key here, the key balance here is um, to require ir uh, drip irrigation in this area only. Um, so you don't have sprinkler heads that pop up and can get damaged by lawn mowers and, and end up you know, spilling out all over the place. So I think it's a simple, easy solution that uh, everyone can be happy with. How do you prove that that system is gonna save water? It's not. Drip system, well, I mean, there's certainly, that's water. That's more water. It's absolutely water, but what, what we're doing is eliminating the possibility of those faulty and pr improperly set sprinkler heads that you often see spraying into the street. You won't have that anymore, and you won't have overspray anymore because it's all right at the roots. The amount of water that grass and shrubs need in that berm is much, much less than what is being offered through these sprinkler heads that pop up and sprinkle. The, uh, the uh, uh, Josie's right. I mean, the, we, we really focused uh, on the water usage and, and the waste of water. And, you know, when you have them spraying out into the street or the sidewalk, it's like a big bull's fly and it jumps out at people and it's, you know, it's like a red flag waving. Um, but like like Josie said, we're even with the with the drip method, we're still using water. I don't know that the planning board, if it was ever really discussed with them that that the the impetus behind this was saving water. Yes, it was. So, was it? Okay. Yes, it so, certainly was, and that was where the the um because as you know, the the president of the garden club is on the planning board, and she um was the one that brought up the drip irrigation. So yes, it, it, it was discussed in that light. Um, the other thing that that is also part of the discussion is homeowners would be offered what approximately, we don't have a number, maybe five different types of stone they could use. So it would limit their choices and what they could do to, you know, landscape, beautify their own, their own property. Because when you come in and do road projects and the borough's got to replace whatever they tear up, now the borough is going to have to go find whatever somebody used. So the the recommendation from the director of public works was you give people five choices, roughly. So now you're going to start limiting people to what they can use there. Their options are going to be limited. Um, the other thing that I would that I would offer, and this wasn't talked about at the planning board, but it's just something I was thinking about is. Now, when we start to, to put these stones in, do we start to use more pesticide? And are we starting to, like, where we want to address one issue, now we end up exacerbating another issue, and 
you know, the other thing is, as you walk along, you'll see it, you're going to probably, your new construction will be tearing out every mature tree that's in that right away. Um, it just seems that maybe we, we were then start to, as we focus on one environmental issue, we completely start to uproot, no pun intended, another one. So that's kind of, I personally would like to just have a little bit in, more information on the pesticide use. And maybe the one thing I was thinking too, in order to get just, you know, a good rounded opinion from, from folks in town is consult with the shade tree committee on what's their thoughts of, you know, these, these mature trees now that would essentially all be taken down because you're not, the landscaping would become the stone. Because as you see with the trees, you're gonna have to build it up and build around it, around the root base. And it just, you're, you have folks that are spending a lot of money for these properties. And then we start limiting them to five types of stones. We, you know, mature trees are not gonna be able to stay. It just seems to be a little bit of an overreach where if we truly wanna conserve conserve water i mean if you even if you think i was thinking about it this way would we ever want to take every third island and make it stone you know we don't want to look we we personally the borough would we ever want to do that we like our landscaping so if the drip irrigation is something that minimizes the water use yet doesn't dictate so much to a property owner what they can and cannot do and perhaps start to add to the use of pesticides spraying these stones where is where's the balance there well let me, I, just, let me just say that also i think grass has um things put on it that is probably just as to toxic and um, i'm not disagreeing with any of that so are we willing to take an island and do a drip system i think we've been talking about evaluating our own use of water for years because the largest, the largest user of, of water is the borough. And we've talked about this for a long time to, to aggressively address what we're doing for water conservation. So while we, I mean, we should be setting an example rather than telling folks moving forward, you, you're a little 50 foot wide or 45 foot wide by three feet, this is what you're gonna do. And then we're not doing anything very proactive on our own large grass areas. So I'm just throwing it out there that we could be leading by example in some way and truly making a difference in the water usage, then not allowing folks to have their dream home, so to speak. Um, and it's a, and that patch of grass, as opposed to what we're doing. And just an observation. And it was, my, it was my understanding when this was brought up, it was not telling people who already have what they have. This was for the future. Right. This isn't saying dig up your grass now, dig up your trees, put stones down. New construction. Down. For new construction. And, you know, and new construction is millions of dollars. Someone, I believe someone at the planning board, and I can't recall who, use the word compromise and I, I'm a big believer in compromise and I think I think maybe the drip maybe that is a good compromise but is there any way that we could get some data on like the pesticides is, is an issue I agree with you 100% um, could we get some kind of a measure on on the uh, the efficiency of a drip as for water uh, usage as opposed to the sprinkler systems that you know some data that could say well you know these will use less water and I don't know it uh, and probably enforcement's an issue again but I think they're all done by timers right uh, hey, so not, not, not to jump in but uh and it's no hard data but I believe this issue I suggested this issue several years ago and it might even predate your you're um, joining council, but I believe Gary Barber was before council and testified, or not testified, but he spoke to the issue and said that categorically, the drip system uses much less, uh, much less water, and also um, 
you don't have that opportunity for wastefulness of the overspray because of the wind or the, um, the faulty units uh, not set properly. So he was before council on another issue and he spoke to this and it was unequivocal that this was beneficial. Um, he did mention and that the installation of such is more complicated, but nonetheless, it would improve by a, by a wide margin the amount of water usage. So yes, I think it's accurate to say that this is a compromise between, between competing interests and, and you know, I think it's the way to go. Well, if need be, maybe we can hear from Gary again, if he'd be willing to. And I guess like on a time, it must be run on a time basis. And I don't know, I think we have time limits. Where's Ray? And uh, in our, when our sprinklers can be on and off, and perhaps we have time limits when you run your drip irrigation as well. Uh, so see what he has to say. And that may help some people to make their decision here we can see, right, is there some way of showing, there must be some way of showing gallon for gallon what one uses versus the other, I would think. Excuse me, could I uh, interject here? Uh, drip systems typically use a quarter to half the water of a sprinkler, and you avoid the soil erosion, uh, the runoff or evaporation of water. That's it, thank you. I couldn't think of that one other element. You're exactly right, Jennifer. Evaporation is the other huge, huge factor. But I also see Grant Russ waving his hand here, so maybe he has something. Ms. Mrs. Gensimer was right. It's half the usage. There's not only timers, there are moisture sensors, and there's all different types of, of um, equipment you can use other than just a timer to gauge how much moisture is in the ground. Okay. Well, I think what we have to do is get more, the, the ordinance has to be, the one section has to be crafted as far as the retaining walls. And then the time we, we can get more information on, maybe we wanna get some exact more information from on the drip irrigation to help people make a decision and we'll introduce it. Once we have it crafted, we would introduce it for vote. I agree. If, if you want to hear from landscapers, we certainly can on this. Um, and I also, like I said, I'm interested in the, in the pest control aspect and I was interested in hearing from the shade tree committee as well. They meet on July 17th. Oh, at the last Go Green, I think it was discussed in their minutes, but I could be wrong. Go okay. Green, not Shade Tree. So do what I guess we'll continue to work on the ordinance, bring it back for further discussion and, and keep moving forward with it. So we can bring it back in another month for a discussion and see where you're at. And if, unless you want to bring it back in Three weeks. The next time we meet will be in three weeks. We'll what see what, what it looks like. With respect, what committee is going to be working on this? No committee. Paul Cates is going to rewrite the ordinance with the masonry in there. So flood mitigation is out of this? No, nobody's out of it. He's rewriting the, the ordinance for the masonry part. And then the rest is we just need to get information as far as, you know, we, Natural resources, pest control falls under the, the purview of natural resources. And so does shade tree. So it seems to me it falls right into your lap. Both those issues fall under natural resources. Sounds good. And just Josie then, if you could bring the information back on those two issues, a pet, we would like to know more on pest control, and we would like to know what the how the shade tree committee feels about this, and then we can bring it back up the next time under um, natural resources, the natural resources work section. Um, one more item for discussion, Beach Patrol Building. 
Who wants to take the lead on beginning the discussion? Mr. Smith? Uh, Me too. Mark de Blasio. Okay, so, I'm uh, here's the deal. This, <laughs> Bob Smith here. This is not a pass, but I think Mark de Blasio is, is uh, probably best prepared to lay out uh, the various options and the history. Uh, I'm certainly here to support and help answer any questions. Um, I can tell you leading up to this meeting about a week ago, we were meeting on a regular basis weekly. It was uh, Sandy, Mark, Ray, myself, and we were just trying to move this along to build a consensus so that you know we would uh, be able to go to design shortly. So th th there was a divergence of opinions, I believe. So we thought it was important to just lay out the various options, have a discussion uh, so that, you know, Mark can go back and, uh, you know, execute any orders from, from the council. So just to give you an update here. So in early May, we had successfully submitted your CAFRA permit for this, your DEP, NJDEP CAFRA permits. That's currently winding its way through the system. Um, as Bob had mentioned, we did meet on a uh, weekly basis up until about last week. The last several um, <clears throat> meetings that we had, we had the architect involved, Bill McLeese, who I believe was a phone call. The, and I'll let Bill get into the details uh, more specifically, but there were we had heard there were concerns relative to cost, relative to modularity of the building. Bill was able to go back to the drawing board and reconfigure some of the, um, the internal floor plans to save some money while still uh, keeping um, Sandy's input in to keep it functional for Sandy. There was a price reduction that was uh, associated with Bill's change. It also put the borough in position to uh, potentially consider some modularity of the building in certain sections of it. So we went through that gyration. That culminated in a uh, final floor plan, so to speak, or final conceptual design on, on May 27th. And then I was asked to give a proposal that would reflect executing those changes, which went to Bob on June 1st. But what I would like to do is I'd like to turn this over to Bill McLeese, who's gonna speak more specifically to all of the changes and all of the important topics that council may have. So, Bill, are you on the line? Yes, I'm here. Okay, the floor is yours. So, um, that was a good kind of summary of where we are from Mark. Um, I probably don't have to remind you, we, we began work in August of last year, working with Sandy um, on trying to find a, a solution for a new Beach Patrol building there on the same site. So we went through that process, kind of explored what the needs were there, um, how to accomplish that more or less within the footprint of the structures that are there today. Um, and that resulted in the uh, conceptual design that we presented in October. Um, that budget, I think we had a building cost of $2.4 million. And I think the total project cost when you included the the restroom building and the improvements for a cul-de-sac at the end of the street there and some other site and landscape improvements. I think that was a $4 million budget. So we kind of went back, re-examined some of that. Some of those site components got pulled out. The restroom building was kind of tabled and put to the side. <clears throat> Excuse me. We were able to find other avenues to, to simplify the design, still trying to stay true to the original um, guiding principles, which really was to kind of tie it to Stone Harbor and harken back to the life-saving station and that, that kind of seashore character and style that would seem appropriate and, and frankly that Stone Harbor deserves to have on their beachfront for a public building. Um, we explored alternative roof lines, which would reduce the volume some, somewhat, um, and we've even gone so far in a consecutive design revision to kind of rework the layout on the ground floor to consolidate utilities and construction um, under in a in more of a core area 
in the building, moving the restrooms and, and um, locker space so that, that those utilities are kind of consolidated somewhat. What that does is also allows us to have, you know, a couple bays of storage. And if you want, I can share my screen here to walk you through. So um, if we look, Mark, I can't hear him. Can you? Bill, you need to unmute. So I could zoom it in. My keyboard doesn't like doing two things at the same time there. Huh. So um, if you see, previously we had the, the lockers and restrooms over here. We've moved them over under the two-story portion. So it really kind of consolidates the fit out, for lack of a better description, for the building uh, under that two-story portion. So now we have storage space over here, which is in that one story portion. Um, that's an area where maybe we can explore some alternative building approaches because I know that's been a topic of conversation. So if I could touch on that a little bit, um, the building approaches, there are modular buildings and there are pre-engineered buildings. And I've heard the word modular construction and can we explore modular construction with regard to this project um, in, in some previous conversations. And what I would tell you is this, um, modular construction to me is when you're fabricating a building offsite, you're putting it on a truck, driving it down a road and assembling it on the site in one or more pieces, right? Not unlike um, the, the homes that you see brought in on trailers and married up um, side by side together, you know, to a single house on a site. In our case, we're looking at constructing at grade so that we have access for um, handicap accessibility, but also more importantly, to get vehicles and boats and equipment in and out at grade. That's not really a great scenario for a modular constructed building. However, possibly the second floor areas could be considered for that type of construction. I did reach out to a modular uh, company, uh, Spartex the name of the company, kind of walked them through it and they kind of, you know, I, I forwarded the plans to them by email and they wrote a polite email back more or less, which said, we really don't think we're a good fit for this. And frankly, I would, I would tend to agree with them, you know, in my opinion and my experiences from having worked with modular buildings and on, on other properties. Um, the other alternative is a pre-engineered building. So there's metal pre-engineered buildings and there's wood frame pre-engineered buildings, which are more, um, in a colloquial terms referred to as pole barns. That's one manufacturer, but there's several manufacturers that have that type of construction technology. So for those of you that aren't familiar, a pole barn is built by a series of uh, wood posts that are either embedded into the ground or embedded on, on top of, or in a, uh, what's called a perma column, where they have a concrete post portion that gets embedded in the ground that's mechanically fastened and essentially this, this same member uh, with wood framing above above it. So effectively, you would have a six inch by six inch concrete post in the ground fastened to a wood six by six post that would be above grade. Um, those posts are spaced at um, distances that work to our needs. Um, there are limitations. And then what happens is, unlike typical, uh, what I'll call stick frame construction where you're standing studs up in vertical uh, it's 16 or 24 inches on center to frame up walls. The um, pre-engineered wood or pole barn buildings are using two by construction horizontally from post to post uh, in a, what's called a girt system. And from there, they're hanging exterior and interior wall assemblies onto those girts. Um, and that basically makes up the wall construction. Roofs, uh, roof areas above would be framed out as trusses. And that's kind of where we foresee this going anyway right now would be to trust the roof areas. Um, so we did explore uh, the plans and you know the possibility of doing this building as a pre-engineered pole barn building. I spoke to three manufacturers. Um, one was located in Hamilton, New Jersey. They're not, um, they're not 
licensed or certified to do prevailing wage work. So that kind of knocks them out right off the bat because obviously we're going to be a publicly bid um, procurement process. So that they're going to need to meet your criteria for um, New Jersey public bid law. I spoke to a, a manufacturer who's in PA, um, Cochrane, sorry. Cochrane was the name, Co Cochraneville Construction. Um, they do similar type of building to what we're describing. Um, they can do multiple stories. They would need to get, they have previously been prevailing wage, uh, would have to get recertified. So they were interested, sent the plans to them. They kind of wrote back almost immediately and said, we're not interested. It really is better suited to a stick frame approach. Um, some of that, I think, when we look Bill, you're muted. The, that complexity goes back to the style and the character, the architecture that we're trying to that we're trying to achieve here. Um, certainly, if that gets modified, that probably opens us up to more possibilities on the pole barn front. Um, we did speak with one manufacturer, which is Conestoga Buildings. Uh, he did receive the plans. He did feel that they could accomplish something in a pole barn approach, a post and beam approach, just like I described, and get this building done, even including the tower, which frankly, I was somewhat surprised. And so spoke to him about the process and, and um, sequencing and, and how they saw it going. They can, you know, we can do it where they design everything and they're going to provide the engineering from a structural standpoint to support that. They would include the slab if we wanted them to or not. Um, and, and there's some things that I think I'm sure Mark will touch on that, that I think they're important considerations that, that need to be addressed before we make a decision one way or the other there. Um, they did suggest that they felt they could probably take a month off of the construction schedule. Um, I should point out they, they offered that without even knowing what construction schedule we're talking about. I think that's just a general rule of thumb as they feel that that's, that's really the, the selling point for, for that type of approach is that you can get it on site, stand it up quickly, and then go about fitting out the rest of the building. Um, I have to explore, as we would anyway, um, their ability to meet the design requirements at this particular site, specifically, you know, wind design, um, dealing with the lateral loads on, a, on a, an exposure that we have, which is basically unobstructed exposure to um, winds off the ocean, down the beach. Uh, that's an important point that, you know, we would explore in any building design, but certainly even more so with this building design, just by the nature of the fact that it's a, a post and beam type construction. Um, one interesting point that I would tell you, um, and I know that we're looking for alternatives to try to save money wherever we can. I had mentioned, you know, similar to construction scheduling, can you give me a sense of, you know, what the square footage cost would be for the shell? And obviously, of course, you know, I'm catching him um, on the phone and not without a whole lot of information other than the, the conceptual plans that we're looking at here. Um, he said he would have to go back to his engineering group and, and kind of study that a little bit. And I said, okay, but you know, just in a larger sense, do you have a, an idea just like construction scheduling? Is there some factor of cost that you feel your buildings typically shave off? You know, is it a similar 10% you know, or 15% or something? And he said, well, materials are materials. So it really, you know, we're not really saving much in terms of materials. And obviously if we're going to be going down this road and including that approach, that post and beam approach, whether it be Conestoga or another one built into the specification for the project, that's going to have to be completed at prevailing wage. So that kind of sets the wage rate. So I don't know, surely, you know, maybe there's a couple dollars of savings one way or the other, but they, he didn't seem to think that he wasn't jumping out of his seat to say, oh, I'm going to save you 15 or 20%. So um, that's kind of where we ended up uh, on the pole barn front. Um, you know, we put the, we put the design together um, for the borough and, you know, we're, we're excited to be involved in it and, you know, we think it's a great building. We, we want to see it be a great building for Stone Harbor, 
But moreover, I think, you know, we're here to solve your goals and your priorities. And those priorities I see are to satisfy the operational and functional needs that Sandy has for the facility going forward for many years. Um, we want to meet the aesthetic requirements that, you know, you as a govern governing body and, and frankly that your constituents have for Stone Harbor and what you feel is appropriate for your community to have as a public building in the public domain. And, and the third point is budget. And, um, you know, we want to do this at, at the budget that you feel is right. And if we, um, if we have to save dollars, you will know, we'll find a way to do that. And um, we're happy to continue exploring, uh, incorporating a full barn type approach to this. In my, in my opinion, I think it's realistic to expect there'll be some modification to the design. Obviously, we have one person that's willing to say, yes, we can get that building done as a pole barn building. Um, and that's good to hear. I don't know if there will be others. Um, the sense that I got from the others that I spoke to is that they're generally competitive in dollars and they're competitive in time frame when it is a, um, a simple building and hence the name pole barn. You know, they're, they're looking to do big um, single span, simple gable roof buildings. And that's where I think they feel they're most ex effective. It's not to say that it can't be incorporated here, but I don't know it's the most efficient use of that building system. So hopefully that answers um, answers some of the questions you had. I'm, I'm happy to answer any others that you might want to bring up now. Yes, uh, Bill, hi, it's Bob Smith, how are you? Good, good. So I'm gonna ask you this question, anybody that might know the answer can certainly jump in. Are you sure that prevailing wage applies to a building that's manufactured in a factory out of state as opposed to bringing in contractors on site? So I would tell you this, for a pole barn building, they will manufacture pieces of it off site. And I would suspect those, in my experiences, that work probably is not subject to prevailing wage, but those pieces of the building will ultimately get delivered to the site and erected. And that work is subject to prevailing wage. Okay, that, that makes sense. Any contractors that are working on site to tie it up, do loose electrical, plumbing, etc. But I mean, the whole advantage, I think, to manufactured building is that we might not have to pay the same rates for the structure because it's being manufactured in a facility and not on site, being constructed on site. Hey, Bob, this, this is Mark. <clears throat> I just want yeah. to clarify one thing because we learned a lot in this process. Bill, can you clarify the term modularity and as opposed to the gentleman you spoke to Conestoga, and correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. Conestoga isn't going to fabricate the building and put it on a truck and drive it here. They're going to fabricate pieces and send they will, it. That's correct. They will assemble, they will assemble the posts. They will pre-cut, I'm sure, pieces, and they will deliver it in parts. So the building... Trusses, just like you see trusses arrive on a truck for a house, that's what you're gonna get for the roof. That's what you'll get for the floor system. Um, you won't have people, uh, and, and I mean, just to try to help you conceptualize this, you're not gonna have contractors um, building a, a masonry foundation out of the ground. What's gonna happen is they're gonna auger holes. They will stand the poles up into the holes um, and cement it in. And those poles are going to be joined by girts, which would be horizontal two bys that run from girt to girt, or I'm sorry, from post to post. There's their preference, according to Conestoga, they would like to be them eight feet apart. I've, in my experience, have done pole barns and other, you know, venues for other reasons. We've done a, you know, a private car collector's garage. We've done RV storage places. We've got a flexible office and shop space. It's actually under construction right now in Summers Point here, kind of. 500 feet behind me. <clears throat> They're all simple span structures. Um, but I have real, I personally have real concern with that building approach on the beachfront. And it was one of the first questions I brought up to them. You know, how do you feel about, you know, digging a hole for your post in beach sand 
and standing all these things up and then expecting it to stand up to, uh, you know, 130 mile an hour wind. So if they have an engineer that's willing to put his signature and seal on the plan saying that it will do that, then I think it's something we can entertain. Um, but that, that was my, that was my primary concern. Uh, so just to distinguish that you have kits that come and then you have modularity, which means it's built. Right. A modular building. We've done that too. Up in Princeton, we did a, um, a golf course clubhouse. And that building arrived in four pieces and they bolted it all together. I'll say 80% of the building was constructed in a factory. Um, they, it was wired, it was plumbed. Um, the contractor built a foundation, which was someone involved, the sloping site on the golf course. But once that was done, this building arrived in four pieces. They bolted it all together, anchored it to the foundation, did their final connections, <coughs> excuse me. And the building was, you know, 95% complete. So that's not this. No, it, it, <laughs> I don't think you're going to find a modular company that would do that for this site, for this building. The uh, garage storage use, um, the at grade condition that we, that I think we require, it's not a good fit. So does that kind of clear that, those two? Alternates, alternates up. Well, I can see that there isn't much savings when it comes to prevailing wage if it's shipped in as a kit, uh, because it is fairly labor intensive once it gets here. Correct. And I, I think one of the reasons why we wanted to look to modular was that we could you know, save some money on the construction because right. uh, most of it would be done in a factory and not subject to prevailing wage. Correct. So Bob, if I, Bob, if I could chime in and Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, what, what we learned in this process is if, if the directive from the borough, let's just say we, re, we, re, we, we go back in time, if the directive from the borough was like a modular building here at day one, we would ha probably have to work with that company to design something that they could fabricate and have hold them. Is that correct, Bill? Yeah, that's correct. And, and um, we have to engage them right away and see what the parameters are for them to be able to build something that they could ship it on a truck, lift off with a crane and work kind of reverse engineer that. Right. And, and so really just to kind of play that out, um, what we would do probably is, is grade the site a bit, I think, so that you could build a foundation, <coughs> excuse me, grade up to the foundation and then set boxes on that foundation that would be modular. But then you're, now you're dealing with a wood frame floor that the boats and the vehicles are gonna sit on. And, you know, boat storage, you're, you're gonna probably want, I mean, your structural engineer, Mark, is gonna tell you we should be designing to 150 to you know, 200 pounds a square foot for that floor, depending upon how many boats uh, Sandy wants to stack on. So um, that's, a, that's a little bit of engineering there. And I just don't think wood floors built into a site where they're effectively at grade, that's just bad design. And I think anybody would tell you that. You don't want wood in contact with the ground or, or near contact with the ground. And, and so that, there's another point that I should touch on with the, with the pre-engineered building. Um, you know, they're going to put these columns or, or posts in the ground and the, and the, port, the portion that's in contact with the ground will be, will be concrete. And the post starts at some point above. And, and we've done that in, in every other location that I've done pole barn buildings. Um, but that, that wall really is, um, unlike a stud frame wall that's sitting on block or concrete, foundation or slab on grade in some cases. Um, this wall is going to almost, it, it'll be attached to our slab, but this slab is not gonna be a structural slab. It'll be a slab on grade. Um, but that, that, again, that wood is gonna be, you know, pretty much, it's gonna be within a couple inches of, of grade, which isn't, again, it's just not, not the best solution in my mind from a design perspective for the life of the building. In, in our in our thinking for this building, um, again, I know this is conceptual, but 
we see this as bringing the foundation wall up, you know, 24, 28, 32 inches, something along those lines. So you get all of the wood for the building up out of the ground. Um, so it's not in contact and it reduces the moisture <clears throat> wicking and all that. So that's kind of, <clears throat> that's the way we saw approaching it. So, um, so Bob, so Bob, and, Bob, yeah. and, Bob and summary, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bill, if the borough wanted to do this, it's possible. We just, we can't, I guess we can't take the design that Bill has and send it to somebody and have it arrive that way it would have to come more like a kit, which I think kind of defeats the, the purpose of it. However, if you wanted to have it come modular, which means it's built off site, it's craned, uh, et cetera, we would have to work backwards with that company to see what they're capable of bringing and um, working design backwards from that SAS standpoint. But they would have to be involved at the ground floor and I don't know what kind of options that we have if you could get something like this. Frankly, I mean, not to harp on it, just with the, the modular approach, I don't know how many modular companies you're going to have really come to the fore and say, you know, we want to be involved in it. I think they're all going to have <clears throat> reservations with that same at grade condition. Um, certainly this can be designed to be, um, it can be designed to be accommodated by a modular company, but I think you'll find hesitation with those companies with the storage level um, aspect in being at grade that way. So I'm wondering if we could take these plans, and, and I know that they're not final plans, and somehow convert it to an RFP mark to see if somebody actually has that ability. Yeah, and what we would have to do, Bob, and you know, I'm gonna be a little granular here, is so foundation-wise, and again, if, if I'm misspeaking, Bill, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. Foundation-wise, anything that's done foundation-wise would have to be designed and built on site. So that kind of gets kicked out of the fabrication off site because you're obviously not gonna fabricate that. I think electrical, mechanical, and plumbing, again, the modular company doesn't know what you want, what you need. So there would have to be basically, for lack of a better term, a design process that you would have to go through. Somebody would have to, as a, as a licensed architect in New Jersey, because the borough's construction code office is gonna require that, have those prints. You're gonna to have to engage a licensed New Jersey <clears throat> for the MEP piece. And then we would have to find out the feasibility of all of those things can be placed in this building. And I guess question, Bill, Modular buildings, I guess they come pre-wired with duct work in them already, et cetera. Like is that okay, yeah, yeah. We, okay. yeah. So again, that would have to be designed to tell that company where to put the duct, where to put the light switches, et cetera. That company would need to be told what kind of finishes, sheetrock, tile, all those other things that are normally involved in a project. You're essentially going through a design process to have either a kit or a modular or even a stick built. So it's almost like you have to go through that anyway. Well, I guess alternatively, instead of sending specs out in RFP and have people, you know, modular con uh, contractors uh, bid on it is you could request proposals for something that is comparable uh, to what is designed here and allow them to design it. Is that okay. a possibility? Yeah, so, so here's a possibility, Bob. So in, in all the projects that we bid, they're subject to the uh, New Jersey Local Public Contracts Law, which allows for a bidder to submit something that's functionally similar, meets the spec, uh, as opposed to something where you specify a manufacturer. In addition, our bid specs allow for a bidder, let's just say hypothetically, the borough, um, the borough directed us to, to, to bid the project as a stick build. And a bidder said, hey, listen, <clears throat> I can bring in a modular building. It, they would be permitted to do that. We would have to go through a review process as long as the um, option that they are presenting was the same as or superior than what was the intent of the bid documents as well as the same cost or less. Right, so there right. is flexibility 
to, to do certain things. Like if we said uh, in a roadway job, we wanted five inches of asphalt and a bidder came back and said, well, you know what, I want to propose to do it a different way. I'm going to give you X, Y, and Z, and it's not exactly five inches and it's a different material. If it met that criteria, we can consider that. So to answer your question is, there's nothing preventing anybody from uh, providing an alternative. If, if this was a stick build bid and somebody could provide it in a modular format, we would certainly be required by law to review that. Yeah, and I guess the question is, you know, do we actively seek that as opposed to somebody just coming forward and saying, I can match it because nobody's going to match it unless we seek them to do so, right? Um, well, it depends. So I've had the opportunity to speak with almost every member of the governing body. And I don't want to speak for anybody here. I think there are differences of opinion about how much money to spend, uh, the procedure, uh, and, and what is truly needed as an end product. So I think it would be helpful, you know, to have some feedback from the members of the governing body, just so we can begin to formulate a plan, I think, Mark, about how to proceed. Yeah, and like I said, um, we're not saying you can't do it, but if, if you do it, it's, it's got to be done in a certain way. And again, we'd have to evaluate at the end of the day, if, if the driver behind this is the same cost, we want to verify that you could do that first. I, I would think if that's really the driver. Um, and you're probably looking at a, at a different building. Um, I think it can be argued, and it has been argued, that we have a fiduciary duty to explore it uh, and to talk about it and have that conversation because we are spending so much money. I think at one end of the spectrum, you're going to have members of council that are almost satisfied with original plans, and then at the other end, you may have a member or two that really want to downsize. And again, I'm not going to speak for anybody. And then you're going to have others in between. And I think some of the in-between in positions have been we need to look at reducing costs in one way might be modular construction. So if I could just make a comment, Bob, I, I think if we had an alternative to the objective of looking at the alternative to stick build, I think we probably don't want to look at a parts kit because I indicated that there was really not going to be any savings. It's, it's material and then that material has to show up and then the actual labor to install that has to be bid, which is subject to New Jersey prevailing wage rate. So I, I think we, I, I think the, I think what we need to look at is can we have a pre-built modular where the analysis should be because I think the kit is probably logically going to um, be the same as a stick belt, so to speak. Does that so make sense? I, I suspect, Mark, that everybody will agree with that position that kits don't make sense and they're probably not attractive. Um, and, and you're just not going to save a lot of money. So why not supervise the construction ourselves from the very beginning? Right. And I think the issue is can, is modular. Okay a viable alternative here? And maybe we don't know that answer at this point. I, I think there needs to be more communication or, or reaching out to modular companies. I, I did have a quick conversation with Jim Kraft. We are researching the issue uh, of prevailing wage. We believe it's just contractors on site and it doesn't apply to factories. But Jim's going to confirm that by tomorrow, if not sooner. I guess question for Bill. Bill, when you spoke to the those three companies, are they saying that this design cannot be made modularly, but they could make the modular if the design was, I guess, altered? So. Um, <clears throat> I spoke to two modular companies. They both said they didn't think 
one was an email, one was a phone call. They both, in in a nutshell, said they didn't think that a modular building approach was was the um, best way to, to approach this building. So um, I think the reasoning is um, a what I touched on all well. The reasoning is two twofold. I would say one is probably has to do with the um, with the massing and the and the design overall how it's articulated as opposed to simplified. And I think the second reason is because of what I touched on earlier, which is it's sitting down on a, you know, basically on a buried foundation. So we, we would basically, if we want, if the borough wanted to go the modular route, the borough would have to probably alter the design to fit that industry's, I guess, standard for what they can fabricate. So it can, so Bob, it can be done. Okay. I, I don't know, maybe it's helpful to just pull the members of the governing body to see direction they prefer. Okay. Um, my opinion was as part of due diligence and let's see if a modular is something that could be done there. And my question was, um, how does it work? Can you show that you show that building to a modular company and say, can you replicate this as close as possible? Or do we do we say to them, you know, what what can you do? So I look at it as part of due diligence. I look at it as it's a it's a two, what are we at now? 2.1 million, I think. I think we started at 2.4, just the beach patrol headquarters. I think we started at 2.4, we're at 2.1 now just and when the way that i think about it is we own the land so the building itself is 2.1 million dollars what can you get for 2.1 million dollars and i'm picturing a home with high-end finishes high-end finishes in the kitchen and four bathrooms and and so on and so forth in my head and then i picture this is several large empty rooms. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around where $2.1 million is going. And I think it's just due diligence to see if it, it you know, to just so when a decision is made, we can say to the taxpayer, we flesh this out every which way. And this was the best way to go. And this is why, because they're the questions we're gonna get. It's $2.1 million, we own the land. What are we getting for that? So we just need as a governing body to be able to answer that question. And if looking at a modular, and is it viable? Is it not? That, that's where I came from on, on this. It's a beautiful building. It's a beautiful design. Um, but I just need a little bit more information as to whether it's necessary to put that much money into it. And in the end, it might that it may be. And, but I'm just not comfortable at this point making a decision yet. I would agree. Um, I think due diligence dictates that we just at least explore, even on a cursory level. Um, I know Mark had mentioned delving into specifics. I don't know that it is terribly time consuming nor uh, any cost off of uh, the boroughs ledger at all to ship this in even even rudimentary pdf format to one or two uh, modular companies um, see what they have to say and i've seen some pretty uh, detailed homes on the island here be done mo in a modular fashion so again it's just exploring something i have some experience with see if it's if it's feasible um, there are there is before and after work that usually needs to take place, which would all have to be done at um, you know prevailing wage rates. But the structure itself, again, it doesn't appear to me as though it's too complicated based on my experience, which is limited, but um, nonetheless, I've seen modulars that don't look any more particularly complicated than this be done and, and done pretty nicely too. So yeah, I think it's worth exploring at least 
initially on a cursory level. And then if something looks good, like it's feasible, then pursue it further. I don't know that we need to go into really detailed specs at this point. Just say, hey, is it possible? Are you interested? And see if we what kind of responses we get from you know a host of, of manufacturers. I think uh, <clears throat> I think the beach patrol building's been falling down for quite some time now, and uh, I when I look at when I think hear about you know pole barns or modular construction, I think those applications are fine um, when you're looking for you know a, a modular construction mm -hmm. place and you say well the guy can offer me six different models of homes or five different sizes of pole barns. I look at a beach patrol building as a custom, uh, it's a custom build because the beach patrol buildings are different for every town that's going to use one. I think we need to make, to get a building that Sandy can use that's first and foremost and meets all its requirements. I also want a building that I can look at 35, 40 years from now and that it's going to look as good as it did the day it was built or maybe even a little better as it ages. So I want a classic looking building and one that's going to stand the test of time. And I think, you know, we, we brought the price down considerably. That $4.3 million number was thrown out there and everybody, you know, hit the alarm buttons. It's not a 4.3 million. It's, it's more like a 2.2 million. And what are we going to save if we go modular or pole barn? If we save a couple hundred thousand dollars, $300,000, I've heard an awful lot of, of uh, questions here, uh, an awful lot of unknown with these kind of constructions. And I, do we really want to risk going down that path um, for something that should be a mainstay on our beach and something that the whole town can be proud of? So I would go with a stick-built house or a stick-built uh, beach patrol building. Um, I agree with you, Ray. I think you spoke um, very, um, very well, and I do understand both sides of it. I just feel that we have done a lot of work and um, created what Sandy needs, what we need for this community. And um, I do agree that uh, a property sitting on the beachfront in harm's way needs to be built strong. So can I ask a question just for clarification? I I think I understand Ray and Josie to say that what is being presented now is what we prefer. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Yes, I agree. Okay, so Frank, you you feel that same way, right? I do. And I think um, to Charles's point, we've already, um, talk to two modular firms that aren't interested in the project. I mean, they, they got plans and they see what it is that we're trying to do and there was no interest there. So I think we've already, we've already covered that, uh, that base. Okay. So I think we have Reese and Jennifer left, right? Yep, Bob, I'll, I'll weigh in. Um, I, I guess my question is potentially, you know, what would be the trade-off? I mean, what would be an expected cost savings? And at what expense would it be to be able to use a modular construction? I, and, uh, and a lot of that, I believe, would have to be come down to the prevailing wage rate as to how much you could save by doing a modular construction. If it's, and I think that would also weigh heavily as to whether we want to consider moving down that path. Okay, so what you're saying is it depends upon what the savings ends up in. That, that's correct. Okay. Well, at least you have to have a comparison, a comparison between the design, the original design and what the modular design would do. I think that's right, Frank. You would have to have, a, you would have to have another uh, proposal based on it being modular construction and you know how much would that? Uh, what would the difference in cost be to construct that 
um, building versus what would be uh, the, the current um, stick built uh, building. And don't you find it strange that the two people that uh, were contacted didn't have, showed no interest in it? Yeah, I don't, I don't know whether there's other companies out there that might have interest in it. I, you know, that's something that yeah. um, would weigh into it also. I don't, you know, I just plain don't know if that's a, a, a good cross section of potential modular manufacturers. Let me ask this question. If there's a modular company that did express interest, is everyone from council on board at least hearing from them or do we, you just not even interested in hearing? And, you know, nothing for nothing, but again, I'm just looking at this, like Mayor Judy said, from a due diligence standpoint. And Reese, I guess to, to your point about a modular version of this, my thinking is modular will have to be identical to the specs that are proffered by our engineer. My experience is many of these buildings in a residential format are built to the same standards as commercial, all two by six exterior construction. Um, so again, and, and, and highly custom. Personally, I've, I've sold property that's modular that is uh, approaching the one and a half million mark 15 years ago. So it's, it's not, I, I think we can achieve exactly the specs, but again, maybe modular companies aren't interested in that anymore. I don't know. I, I'm surprised to hear that, but I guess I'm curious as to whether everyone just wants to say, no, because they don't want to, no matter what, or <laughs> at least do our due diligence. No, I, I think you're right, Charles. I think if, if there is a modular company out there that can be contacted, that is interested in uh, doing the building, we should talk to them. But if you, you know, listening to, uh, to Bill and Mark, uh, we don't want to end up, like you say, Charles, comparing apples and oranges here, because we're going to say $200,000, but we're really not going to get the same thing. And from what they testified, that's the wrong word, but they, I'll use it anyway, uh, stated, um, these companies that they've talked to, they're not, they're not really looking at providing the same level or the same type of construction. No, that would absolutely be a requirement for me to proceed and go forward. The thinking here being is that you're basically, you know, for lack of it, you're circumventing the prevailing wage law by buying this building out of state and manufactured or in state, but manufactured in the private sector at private sector wages. So there's wherein the savings lie. We will still have site work related to the foundation and um, perhaps decking and, and, and footings for those decks. So there's going to be considerable amount of work on site still, but nonetheless, it's, again, I'm just going off my experience. The savings were not only time, but in this arena related to prevailing wage laws. So again, I, I would absolutely make, I, I would make sure that it's all the same identical construction, not, not sacrificing anything apples to apples across the board. Right, and then, and then you also have uh, their experience level in, in building something like this. Okay, fellas, we're not building a pole barn now. We're building a custom beach control headquarters, you know? So who's got the experience uh, in, that, in that kind of construction that's willing to take this on uh, and can show us the things they've done in the past that are similar? See, it's interesting, though, because in this arena, I find this building to be less um, complicated in terms of finish and fit out because it doesn't involve a high-end kitchen. It doesn't involve a high-end bathroom fit out. And they, I've seen Modular do that before. We're talking something decidedly more utilitarian here. And so those, they're going to give you finish options, which are actually more commensurate with what I think we're trying to produce here which is, you know, a, more of a locker room type. We're not, we're not looking for that high-end finish marble custom tiled bathroom. This is more utilitarian for sure. So I, I, I got to tell you, I mean, from the get-go, I saw this as an opportunity to save money without sacrificing anything. And the exterior can be cedar shake. If anyone's interested, get online, 
Look at 1700 Franklin Avenue in North Cape May. I built that about 14 years ago. It's all cedar shake and it's modular. You'd never know it. So again, just my experience, I'm doing what I think is best for you know our public and our constituency here to save money so that it can be spent on pump stations and roads and everything else this borough needs and has needed for quite some time. I, I can't help but shake the feeling that going down this path, we're, we're assuming some risk here. And is that something we wanna do uh, for the sake of a few hundred thousand dollars? Well, that's the point. We don't know, we don't have any comparison at all of what we might be able to save. And to your point of risk, that's another added factor. And I would be I would be curious to know if this if any of these companies and I heard what you just said, Charles, um, have done something that is actually on a beachfront um, location as our lifeguard shack is now our lifeguard building is. Um, I that was right. Um, I have a question for the architect. Yes. Um, you stated that if we would go with uh, either a modular or a pole building, it, w it would be built on grade and we would have wood uh, directly touching the ground. Why, why would that be the case uh, only in a modular or stick build and not uh, only in a modular and not a stick build? So with a modular building, in order for them to generally, at, they're constructed as boxes, you know, four to six sided boxes, <clears throat> which means it has a floor system. Um, generally, that floor system is the floor system for the building. And as Charles pointed out, it, it's fairly easy to construct a modular home because you can imagine all homes are built up on a foundation. So that wood floor system is elevated two feet or more out of the ground and you have a crawl space or perhaps a basement. Um, in our scenario, if particularly at the ground floor, we're a slab on grade condition. At least we had envisioned from a design standpoint that that would be a concrete slab for all of the storage bays, as well as, as, well as the, uh, the offices and the, and the locker rooms and bathrooms. Um, that's the way we saw this building getting constructed. If we were to pursue a modular approach, and again, it's not designed, <clears throat> right? We'd have to go through that design process with the modular company. I suspect they're going to come back and tell us, you know, it's got to be a wood floor. That's how we build our modular boxes. I can possibly foresee a way that perhaps they could deliver a building, a box that would be maybe three-sided with temporary braces where the floor would go. But Nevertheless, it would still have to have a bearing wall, probably on both sides or tightly spaced posts on at least one side. Whereas we have a storage bay area right now, which is relatively open from bay to bay. Um, you know, given, given Sandy the flexibility to move equipment and boats and, and whatnot. So I think there'll be some limitations structurally. If those storage bays were even able to be delivered um, and sat on a slab on grade. I, I highly doubt that a modular company would be able to achieve that, which is getting away from the apples to apples that Charles touched on. So, and that's what I brought up before. I, I tend to think, and, and I'm not trying to bias anybody's opinion because at the end of the day, we want you to get the best product for the lowest cost, you know, for your constituency. And that, that makes complete sense. Um, I, I doubt that any modular company is going to tell you that they'd be able to sit this down on, on a concrete slab and have the concrete slab be your finished floor. I think what's more likely is going to be, they're going to want you to build a foundation and grade up to the foundation and the proposed floor we're talking about putting in, which would be probably framed out of wood with joists or trusses at something like 12 inches on center to get, you know, a storage loading, a heavier loading uh, rating for the floor. That's what I would suspect. I'm not aware of any modular company that will deliver um, modular boxes with a concrete floor. Okay, so why, why would the offices and bathrooms be on the same uh, grade or level as storage? 
The bathrooms are requested to be on the same level for ease of access for the lifeguards. I'm sure Sandy could probably speak to that further. The beach tag office is the only office that's on the ground floor. And I think that probably, you know, from a logic standpoint, makes sense that you've got, you know, customers coming up, walking either to or from the beach or arriving at the end of that street to walk up and purchase a beach tag, more or less the way it is today. So those, those are really the only occupied spaces other than storage at that ground level. The offices are up, are up above. Okay, um, Bob, if I could, um, could I state my opinion now on this? Um, yeah, abso absolutely. Um, I would only came on borough council five months ago. Um, unfortunately, I came into the middle of this when this already started. I see uh, the entire uh, project flawed in in its um, in its design in that it wasn't a budget based design. Uh, somehow, uh, the costs of this project uh, are extraordinary, and I feel that I have a fiduciary duty uh, to the taxpayers to do everything I can to uh, examine ways to um, uh, protect and spend with caution. Um, I'm not comfortable with the price of this building, especially that we are not buying land. Um, I think we have to make every effort to save money. If that means looking at other alternatives, we absolutely should. I have done construction for a Fortune 500 company, and I can tell you we've done stick, we did stick built and we did modular, we did both. And um, I think we owe it to our constituents to go down that path and explore it and uh, to take a look. I think our CFO needs to be more involved in the design process. We spend a lot of money designing, redesigning, redesigning again, and redesigning again when we don't start out with the budget. Can I throw it can I throw another question on the table, which is um, related to the first? Um, we have, we're expecting delivery very shortly of modular bathrooms that are going on site because the bathrooms at 95th are in very bad shape. They need to be you know, disposed of. And so part of the plan that was presented were bathrooms here and I believe the amount was very close to $500,000. So the question is, do we want to uh, hold off on the bathrooms that were planned as a part of this design and rely upon the modular for a period of time or not? Because I've heard different opinions from different members of council. I thought that was already the plan that the, the bathrooms were came in like 400,000, 450,000, that the modular was going to be set in place and then perhaps eventually moved to the point. But for now, that was also part of the cost saving measure was that that modular bathroom was going to remain at 95th Street. I thought it was, but I heard different opinions. So that's why okay. I'm asking that question. I, I, at the public safety committee meeting, I heard members of the committee saying the bathrooms as designed by Bill need to stay. So I'm just- no, no, That's news to me. I thought that that was already decided that the new modular would stay. Is everybody in agreement on that? That the bathrooms come out for 470? Yeah, I, I, don't, I think I agree with the mayor uh, that was the, plan. the mayor's uh, <clears throat> statement that the plan it now is to put the modular bathrooms there uh, in lieu of building new bathrooms for however long, five years or whatever. And and I didn't I did not hear that at the public safety meeting. I, okay. I didn't hear you say that. Yeah, and Bob, I thought the same thing. Well, what? The bathrooms were already purchased. Yes. So yeah, I don't think. I mean, that was a plan a long time ago, in my mind. 
Okay. But they would remain there for a couple of years, a modular, right, right. But they, yes. Okay, perfect. So there's, uh, that's unanimous that bathrooms are coming out of the design. Yes. That's yeah. 470, 480 right there. Right. Okay. Bob, those are all the, pub that's a public bathroom, not, not anything to do with inside the, the Correct. Uh, beach patrol. Correct, yes. So where do we go from here? Um, I, I need to do research and along with Jim, and we need to reach out to some modular companies, independent of Bill, no offense, but um, the representations being made need to be verified. And that's a, you know, a duty that Jim and I have. And that's going to be one of the next steps. Okay. And in the end, we may end up right back here. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Ray, question for Ray Poudrier. Ray, elevation top of block in the beachfront there is uh, 12 or 11? Is this the one? Maybe, maybe Mark the Blasio, if you know, is that in the, is that in the, well, I, I, that, no, I think, it, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's in the X zone. Yeah, it's actually zone X, ironically. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what were you going to be getting at with that, Charles? What, what's the, what's the question? I'm just thinking of where, where our top of block is going to come to. So our top of block is coming to elevation 11. Where is the, where is the, where is a uh, natural grade for the parking lot right now? You know what, Charles? I don't have that in front of me, but I'm going to venture to guess it's probably seven or eight. Yeah, I know. I know it's fairly high. I looked at a property right near there. So yeah, that sounds about right. So if you're pulling out of the ground to let's say 11, you're coming up three or four feet. Okay. No, I'm just just thinking. Okay. Okay. So what do we, do we want Bob to come back with more information for us in three weeks? I can do that. No. Yeah. At the next, at the next council meeting? Yes. Overall consensus, nod your heads, put a thumb up. Yes. Okay. All right. And that's because we, yeah, there's an extra Tuesday in June. So the next time we meet is not till I believe July 7th. So that would give a couple of weeks for Bob to look at some stuff and we can discuss it again. Good, that's okay. right. Okay. A long work session. So that is the extent of items for discussion on the work session. So we have, um, we can get a motion to adjourn and go right into the council meeting we could get a motion to adjourn, take a two, three minute break, come back and start the council meeting, whatever your pleasure is. I'm for the two to three minute break. Okay. okay. I second it. Okay. All right. So. Motion to adjourn. I say that. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. Opposed? I'll see you in two or three minutes. Care. Have a good night.
I believe everyone is back. Let me find my other agenda. That was a record. Three hours. Okay. Okay. Sue's the clerk is on. All of council is here. The meeting is now called to order. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Here. Mrs. Gensimer? Here. Sefton? Here. Mr. Moore? Here. Mr. Parzik? Here. Mrs. Rich? Here. Is anybody getting a weird sound in their, in their? Yes. Is it you? I push it down, it says temporarily unmuted. Yeah, it's each time the clerk pushes down, it makes that noise. That's what it is. Um, the meeting is now open. Adequate notice of the meeting was provided by posting a copy of the time and place on the municipal clerk's bulletin board and mailing a copy of same to the press in the Cape May County on April, in the Cape May County Herald on April 16th, 2020. This meeting, this council meeting for the record is being held via telephone conference, video telephone conference via Zoom. Will everyone please rise to salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'll just remind everybody to remain muted and be very cognizant of not removing that feature. First off, we have a doc hearing. Is Mr. Bowen still here or did he leave? I do not see him. We'll move on and if he comes back, we can go back to that. Um, so we're going to move on to Mr. Tom Thornton. He's got an update on the 93rd Street Stormwater Pump Station. Are you still with us, Tom? Yes, I am, Mayor. Oh, there you are. Did you enjoy the three-hour work session? I did. I did. I learned a lot. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the floor is yours. Very good. Thank you and good evening and uh, thanks for inviting me to give you an update on the 93rd Street Pump Station project. And I will go right into a little PowerPoint here. Uh, if I can share my screen. There we go. Okay, so uh, we've been at this for a while now, as you know. Um, and I have a, a presentation here that's just going to give you an update on, on where we are, where we've been, uh, a few graphics just to illustrate uh, what we're doing here with this, this project. Um, so completed tasks so far. Uh, obviously, we completed the survey a while back, completed the base map. Uh, one of the first tasks was to conduct the modeling and the hydraulic analysis to make sure we understood the flows that would be coming to the pump station and the flows that could be directed by gravity um, so that we can optimize this uh, system, the overall system, to be the most economic uh, and yet the most effective system that we can uh, design. <clears throat> um, soil borings and the geotechnical work is complete. And at this point, we stand at about 60% overall uh, complete in the design of both the collection and conveyance system and the pump station itself. So there's, <clears throat> there's various disciplines that go into this, obviously. There's geotechnical, there's structural, there's electrical, there's mechanical, uh, there's architectural, uh, just you know, related to the pump station alone. Um, and some of those disciplines are further advanced than 60%, but overall we're at about 60%. Our proposal um, stated that we would be providing a 75% set of documents to the borough um, as we go. So we're just about at that point. Uh, we conducted a 30% design meeting back in March, and we are hoping to have a 60% design meeting, which basically uh, gets us to where we are now. Uh, hopefully, we can schedule that next week. Uh, we provide monthly reports to the borough at the flood mitigation meetings, 
And we also provide monthly updates to the DEP, which is the grant agency for this project. Uh, just moving into some of the design details, the, the design criteria <clears throat> uh, really is the uh, achieving, um, uh, handling the flooding that results from a 10 year storm with the exception that we would allow for nuisance flooding at intersections. Um, this was the criteria that was used uh, before we were brought on to secure the grant. Um, and it, in our opinion, is, is reasonable. Uh, typically for um, just rain events, for example, a lot of uh, planning boards would have a 25 year design storm for, for rain uh, events for subdivisions and stuff like that. But once you get into the tidal situation, a, a 10 year storm is, is more typical. Um, and we think that's a good standard to achieve and, and that's what um, we will be achieving. As far as the <clears throat> design, some of the design details of the collection and conveyance system, uh, we are continuing to utilize uh, as much of the gravity system as is economical and feasible since that is uh, free, gravity is free. And as long as we don't spend a lot of money on new gravity systems, it makes sense to do that to reduce the, uh, the impact on the pump station and uh, to, to minimize costs to operate and maintain the overall system. So we will be retaining uh, select existing outfalls and we'll be equipping them with tide check valves. Um, tide check valves have had some improvements in, in recent years. We've gotten away from the, the standard duck bill uh, that you used to see and I'm sure still do see, um, but there's a cut there. They've got some competition now. So there's other, <clears throat> other versions of these uh, similar tide check valves, which would be uh, suitable for the borough's use on some of these gravity outfalls. Um, we're all familiar with the, the term flattening the curve and um, in, in our situation here, we're relying on storage in the street to flatten the curve of the peak flows that end up going to the pump station. So the, if you don't have that dampening effect, your pump station would have to be much larger than it has to be. So what we're doing is we're <clears throat> uh, designing some large diameter pipes to be placed within the third avenue in, or right of way that will provide some storage to uh, delay the, the flows reaching the pump station, which allow us to have a pump station that is uh, able to be uh, built on the, the small site that we have. The combination of the gravity and the pressure system will also utilize special structures where, uh, for example, at 93rd Street and Sunset, we're gonna have a gravity system that discharges directly to the back bay but once it reaches a certain level and the tide is high, it, it spills over a weir and the excess flows at that point will be directed to the pump station uh, from where they will be pumped out uh, back 93rd Street out to the outfall. Uh, one thing we just wanted to make sure everybody, everybody understood is the, <clears throat> the drainage area that we're um, covering here is basically from 88th to 99th Street and it extends up to about Second Avenue, but there's there's flows that go towards Second Avenue that are already collected in a series of inlets and structures that are currently directed pretty much through this area and out through their own uh, outfall. And if we were to include all those flows, the pump station would would be impractical. Um, and I have a illustration and a slide or two here I can show that. Uh, right now, the pipe design is undergoing a QA, QC process. Uh, a couple of things that came out of that is one of them is related to the county's request that we abandon an outfall at, at 89th Street and 3rd, where the, out, or the, pipe, the outfall pipe actually extends beneath a house. Um, so they've asked us to abandon that, which we can do, but those are flows that would otherwise uh, not be directed to the pump station. So now we're going to have to direct them back around to the yacht, uh, an outfall closer to the yacht club. So it's, it's not the most efficient uh, thing, uh, but it's something that um, we're trying to accommodate the county who has agreed to pay a significant uh, portion of this project, basically the structures that fall within the third avenue right away. Um, we also would like to rely on existing outfall at 96th Street uh, between the Reeds and the, the Pizza Pub there, <clears throat> uh, but it's just so tight. There's a tight corridor there. It'd be difficult to increase the size of that gravity pipe there. So we will need an, an another outfall nearby. And I know there's a parking lot there. We still have some research to do, um, but we would recommend if possible getting an easement uh, from the property owner there 
uh, to extend an outfall through that through that parking lot. These uh, are yes. I, uh, just a question: What do you anticipate that easement? When you say procure an easement from a homeowner, what's been your experience in that regard to do that? Do you have to pay the homeowner? Uh, in my experience, it comes down to the relationship that you have with the, the property owner. Um, we're doing a, an easement in, uh, in Avalon for a project where there was, there was no exchange of money required. Um, I don't know yet who the property owner is here. It's, it's, uh, it's a parking lot uh, nearby the reeds. Um, but yeah, in our experience, you would simply, um, you know, start that, uh, that discussion with the with the property owner and hope to come up with an amicable uh, agreement. Thank you. Sure. Uh, the blue that you see here is the drainage area that I described. So you can see it extends from 88th street to 99th street and basically every, most everything to the west of uh, 2nd Avenue. <clears throat> the next slide shows the pipe network. The yellow pipe are the existing, is the existing pipe network. The red represents the additional pipe that we're uh, including in this project. And the blue there you can see running down 93rd Street, that's the force main that's coming from the pump station. So basically everything other than that uh, stretch of yellow pipe that you see on 2nd Avenue, everything is going to the pump station at 93rd Street and it's being pumped uh, down that blue pipe out to the outfall at 93rd Street. This is the area uh, the other drainage area, the sub drainage area that extends through uh, the other drainage area on 91st Street out to its, uh, through its own outfall. That's not included. These flows are not directed to the pump station. So those are some of the design details of the conveyance system. The pump station itself, uh, as you know, there's an existing sanitary sewer pump station and we're replacing that in its entirety. Um, there was some initial consideration possibly retaining some of the wet well uh, there, but the, it was just not, um, the existing conditions were not such uh, that it easily accommodated this. So we, we have uh, decided to demo everything there and just build, build from scratch. Uh, the, <clears throat> the new pump station will handle all flows up to the design criteria that, that I mentioned. It includes three pumps, which I'll illustrate shortly two larger pumps that are 270 horsepower piece and a smaller 67 horsepower pump that can handle some of the larger flows as well as uh, drain the chamber to a lower level, which the larger pumps are not set up to do. The total pump station capacity will be 80 million gallons per day or 124 cubic feet per second. It'll be equipped with a, a screening chamber, obviously a wet well, that's the main feature of it, but the screening chamber in advance of that to screen out all the uh, solids and it'll be automated. So it'll be easy to maintain and, and discharge of the materials that are collected in that screen. Of course, the controls and generator building are on that same site. Uh, the force main at this point, our design consists of a 48 inch force main <clears throat> coming out of the pump station down 93rd Street to the west and discharging through the bulkhead. So there's gonna be some a penetration of the bulkhead there and some um, structural modifications to accommodate the large uh, pipe that comes through there. In order to reduce the flows that actually come through the bulkhead, we're increasing the diameter to 60 inches at that point. So here's just a one of the renderings, a sketch of the pump station control and generator building as seen from 93rd Street. So I believe the finished floor um, requirement here would be normally 11, but in discussion with um, representatives from the, the stakeholder group, uh, it was suggested that we uh, raise it up another foot as if we were in a, uh, a critical facility designed for a 500 year flood. That would be the elevation that would be required if, if we were. so. That puts the top of the building at an elevation of 29.71, and you can see the approximate grade at that location is about 6.5. And then we have a couple of renderings. This is the building as seen from the street, and that's the front of the building and the right side of the building. I have another rendering uh, from the rear. So you see on the on the left and or on the rear and the the side there are the intake and outflow outlet louvers for the generator portion of this building. 
So we met uh, again, we presented this to the stakeholder groups and got some helpful feedback and uh, it's been designed with the, those comments in mind. This is a, um, so Revit is uh, an auto, or it's a, um, it's a design, a computer aided design software similar to AutoCAD. And this is just a model of the actual wet well with the pumps uh, as it would appear on the surface if there were no uh, asphalt or, or lawn around it. So some of these features actually extend through the surface, obviously, such as those doors to provide access to the wet well. Uh, the two tubes you see are the larger pumps. So those pumps can just be pulled up through those tubes. Uh, the middle door there is for the smaller pump. The, the mechanism to the left there you can see is the uh, screening chamber that we discussed. And then we take the, uh, take the lid off of this, so to speak, so you can see the in, inside here. So the, in the middle there, you see the, the wet well itself. So the flows are coming from the left and they're going through that screen. They're entering that wet well through those three uh, openings. Uh, the pumps are pumping the water out uh, through these three discharge into a common 48-inch uh, uh, diameter force main you see there on the right-hand side. So that's the pump station set up in a nutshell. Uh, as far as cost and schedule, um, the total estimated construction cost at this point in, in our design is, is $11 million. This is significantly higher um, than the initial estimates that were provided before uh, we were involved. Certainly uh, well above the uh, grant amount uh, of 2.7 uh, from the DEP. We were fairly early in, the, in this process able to sit down with the county engineer, however, and uh, talk to him about this and get his uh, verbal commitment that the county would be able to share in the cost. Um, and that share would be defined as the improvements that actually fall within the Third Avenue right of way. And based on our cost estimates, that amount comes to about 3.9 million, leaving the uh, borough share of, of 7.1 million for this project based on the 60% design uh, that we're at right now. Um, the schedule, we are getting to the point in this design where it's um, complete enough that we can safely submit our permit application. So we'll be submitting those in, in July. And we are hoping for an expedited uh, permit review. Uh, the grant agency is also the regulatory agency. So we're hoping that our contact um, there can, can help speed that along. So that's a fairly aggressive uh, uh, schedule to obtain a, a permit, but it, it relies on uh, an, an assumption that the DEP is going to expedite this, which we've been led to believe can happen. Uh, we normally would be wrapping up our final plan specifications at that's about that same time. So one potential schedule would be to advertise for bids in October, uh, receive bids six or seven weeks later in, in December and award a contract in July, or I'm sorry, in January of 2021. And that would provide a, a year and eight months or so to complete the project, at least take it to substantial completion by September, 2022. And that, uh, that concludes my report and I can certainly take any questions you may have. Tom, I have one question um, about the budget. Um, you're saying that the borough's portion is the 7.1. Then from that, we still are subtracting the 2.6 million in the grant, correct? Correct. That's correct. Yep. Anybody have questions? I do. Um, with this type of project, um, what, what type of uh, year storm do you normally design for? So in, in my experience for, uh, for systems that are adjacent to tidal uh, water bodies, a 10 year storm is, is what you would typically design for. All right, how did we end up planning for a five year storm? So there was obviously to secure this grant that, and we weren't involved in that process, but we were provided the documents that, that uh, explained that um, benefit cost analysis were required. And I don't recall all the details, but I, I think it, the benefit cost analysis um, 
worked with the scenario that I described. It's basically a 10 year storm, but allowing for some nuisance flooding. Um, I don't know how many iterations of that were done. So I don't know if, you know, if there was a full 10 year storm done and then the, the, the benefit cost analysis was, was, uh, uh, didn't warrant it and it had to be scaled down. I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure, but those, those were the, uh, criteria that we were, we were handed and that's what the grant agency expects. So. All right, and then can I also ask you, at what point did the um, flooding on 2nd Avenue and 1st Avenue be, uh, what point was that eliminated from the project? Yeah, I guess I should be careful. I'm not, I'm not sure it necessarily was eliminated. Um, I don't recall it being part of the design of the, the original design that existed before we were brought on board. I think the way, my best recollection is that it was just presented as you know, this, this area in general would uh, meet the design criteria, but I don't recall any, I certainly don't remember any proposed um, infrastructure tying 2nd Avenue into 3rd Avenue. So I, I don't know if it was necessarily eliminated, um, but in our design, it was uh, pretty apparent from the beginning that it, it you know, it, it just was not going to be feasible to bring those flows into the pump station. I don't remember. Do you, Ray or Josie? I don't remember initially that being part of it either. No, I, I think it went by the, by the drainage basins that were identified yeah. and, you know, the, the real trouble areas and this being the middle one. I don't yeah. think the area at 2nd Avenue being much higher than 1st Avenue wasn't considered a, a real Yeah, I don't remember it being considered at all. To, uh, to address. <clears throat> I agree with you both. Is $11 million a realistic cost, or do you think it's going to end up being closer to 14 to 15 million? No, I mean, it's realistic based on our current status. We, you know, indeed, we've broken these all out in detail, um, and there's a certain contingency as well. So if, 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 if we had evidence or information that it would be higher, we would have presented that. But that's, that's not to say that through the final design process, things may be added, have to be added to that, certainly. Uh, we don't want to over, you know, overstate anything. But at this point, based on the 60% design uh, and a detailed cost estimate, we're at we're at about 11 million. I'm very concerned that the borough has never taken on a project of this magnitude, and I would really um, recommend peer review of this entire project. It would cost approximately $50,000 and we could expect a cost savings in the neighborhood of $250,000. Well, to your, to, to your point, Jen. So this project first started, gosh, 2017, perhaps. And it started out as two pumps were going to be in the 300 block of 93rd Street. Um, we had this grant. And as far as I'm saying this, as far as the peer review, we have had, um, we've had Wally Bishop on this out of the gates. We've had Paul Cates out of the gates. I didn't mean to rhyme. We've had Mark de Blasio. We, we brought in Mott McDonald. This has been reviewed and reviewed and reviewed and, and it's been years of, of looking at this project. Um, I don't know, I feel that it's been peer reviewed. Like I said, we've had four different, four different engineering firms weighing in on this. And Judy, you're correct about that. I believe that the flood mitigation committee was established in 2016. And I think this began um, with, that was one of our projects. And I agree that we have had numerous professionals um, working on this. And I'm quite impressed with where we are right now. And I think we have put lots of time and lots of energy into doing this um, it, it's, it, it has gone from here to here to, to where it is now. And, um, I, I've learned a whole lot. I know that. And I'm very confident that we have the people around us, um, that have done this and it's, it's a great project. And, and the reason why I say that Jennifer is literally from the very first meeting, 
I attended the very first meeting and this has really, really evolved and there was a push for peer review. And then when we were started bringing in, we, we were saying we had at every meeting, we had four different engineers from different companies weighing in. We had Mont McDonald, we had Mott Associates, we had de Blasio and initially r &V. So it has been reviewed and then reviewed and then reviewed. Who's r and r and &V, Remington and Vernon. They were dismissed from the project, is that yep. correct? Yep. Okay, so I'm talking about peer reviewing to where we are today. The reason, the reason we have uh, Mott McDonald on the project partly is because of peer review. Um, you know, that, that's, that's why that company's with us now. And I don't think, I don't think you could really uh, say, well, if we spend 50,000, we're going to save 250,000. There's no basis for that. Um, so, I mean, I, I think we should move ahead as we're doing. You will have better bidding with peer review. Your plans are gonna be more thorough and it's a more professional process. And this project is of a magnitude this borough has never seen. I might beg sure to that. differ. I, how about the, um, the removal of the outfall pipes? I think that was a $9 million project 15 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And also keep in mind too, Janet, that um, 4 million of this is the county doing upgrades for them. So I, I understand, part. Judy. I'm just looking at the magnitude of the entire project. Yes. You know, no, ma no matter what it costs, the borough's going to, uh, excuse me, the county's going to cover uh, a certain amount of it. Then we have a grant. Thanks to Mark. And like I said before, just being in on it from the ground level, I, I don't think I've ever seen a project dissected like this one. Dissected. I mean, would you agree, Ray? dissected there's, um, always, there's always room for improvement and now now we have mont mcdonald come in remington is gone we have mont mcdonald in here there's always room to uh to review it and to save the taxpayers money when well mont mcdonald didn't just come in it's been what 18 months a year a year yeah and that was <laughs> seems like 18 months. <laughs> it does. Um, but however, you know, that is also something that is, I would say, is, is subject to vote or consensus if some if that's a step that the majority wants to take. I mean, that's not my decision to make. Can I make uh, um, Tom, uh, Tom, I guess if, do you have any sense on or input on this is it is this a worthwhile exercise i mean again the the thing that stands out is spending another 50 are we guaranteed returns on that well i mean it's kind of have a vested interest you know in that in, in you know in that answer i mean the like like Ray said, I mean, we we were brought in to peer review this project ourselves and i i guess the standard practice it in my experience isn't to peer review the peer reviewed project but maybe I'm misunderstanding what's being proposed maybe what I, I think what you may be suggesting is that a, a third party could could look at this and perhaps come up with something that uh, that we missed or something and that there could be some element of it that could be uh, cut back or or something um, I, I, I can't deny that that's a you know a possibility certainly um, we would hope that um, we have those own internal controls within our own company. I mean, we have a, we have an interest obviously in keeping the construction costs as low as we possibly can um, for the borough. Um, and that's what we strive to do. Um, one reservation I would have about, you know, having this peer reviewed is that I, I don't know what that, how that would take place. Um, you know, one of the criticisms we had of the previous design was the modeling that was used. We didn't feel it was the appropriate 
uh, modeling uh, program to be used in this uh, you know semi-urban environment. It was something that was more used for you know wide open spaces. Um, but if you were to have something, someone peer review it, I don't know how they would do that without running their own model. And the modeling alone, uh, you know, certainly could cost you know thirty or forty thousand dollars. So. If I could just jump in real quick, Jennifer. Of course. Um, in a sense, we do have peer review at this point. Uh, we have a highly competent uh, civil engineer that is, is helping with the process, a volunteer. And we had a very good conversation last week, it was probably a couple of hours. And I feel confident that at the end of the day, uh, we will have some really good feedback that's going to be beneficial. And it, it, it's something that I believe is going to work out. And I think that we can say, you know, with, with certainty and honesty that it has been looked at hard and the borough is making the right decision. Um, and I think you know what I'm talking about. It, you know, the, the person that I'm referring to does not have errors and omissions coverage. So, but I feel confident that we are getting some really good peer feedback. And I know Tom is the type of engineer that is open to it uh, because he wants the best uh, project at the end of the day. And if I could say one, one thing we do have in all our contracts, and in fact, with this one, it's, it's some of them aren't relevant because the value engineering kicks in usually on $5 million projects, but we have a the value engineering aspect of all our, our construction projects where if the, the contractor, you know, can suggest an alternative way of doing things and it's something that the borough is receptive to, you can realize savings that both from the, you know, for the contractor that those savings are also passed on to the borough. Um, so that's always, uh, you know, you always have that option as well. Uh, one Last question, Tom. The eleven million that does not include include construction management, correct? Correct. That's just construction cost. Yeah. And typically, what is that percentage? It's it's kind of a sliding scale. You know, we would normally say ten percent, but of a project with this size, it, it wouldn't be. I you know I don't know off the top of my head. It might be closer to to eight. Uh, you know, eight percent. And the county is inspecting uh, their own portion. So we don't know exactly where that dividing line is going to be, but if you just take the numbers themselves, then as a very rough starting point, I would suggest a, a budget of maybe 8% of the, of the, uh, of the borough share. So maybe just so the council knows, maybe another half a million on top of the 11. That would be, that'd be my best guess at this point, just based on kind of the standard uh, ratios that are used for these types of projects. Okay. So to, to Jennifer's suggestion, I mean, it's something that, that can definitely be, council's got time to think about it and, you know, if it's something that we want to do, anybody want to weigh in on, on that suggestion? I, I just had asked the question of uh, Mr. Thornton because that was my understanding is that that sort of, not sort of, that was his role when he was brought on board, someone to focus and review what we have and make sure everything was on the level and as um, streamlined and, and, and appropriate. So that's kind of what I thought his role was already. So um, that's kind of where I'm at. It's hard, it's hard to argue. It, it, it it's hard to argue against the peer review. What I worry about is that how far does it go? I mean, if we want to hire somebody for thirty-five or forty thousand dollars to come in and look at, at at Tom's team's work and give it a cursory overlook to see that there's no bad assumptions or um, things that were overlooked. But if we're going to go in and try to dismantle the whole thing and start trying to look for, you know, nitpick problems. We're just going to delay the whole process. And I don't know that we're going to gain anything from it. 
we don't need it re-engineered yet again. It's already been engineered two times, you know? So, um, like I said, if it's a, if it's a, if it's a, a, a general overview of it to see that it all makes sense, what's being proposed, um, I mean, I could support that. Um, the idea of it is not to re-engineer the project. The idea of it is to take take a look at your prints. You can think of it as an audit, if that's if that's more practical terminology. And what it does is it avoids a lot of costly change orders by having another set of eyes essentially proofread what you're doing. Mr. Thornton is an exceptional engineer. He obviously has done an exceptional job and engineers are challenged all the time. And I'm sure Mr. Thornton's been, been challenged many times and I'm sure he will do very well with it. But I think we need to be open-minded to, to uh, peer review and have a fresh set of eyes on the project. Which again, Jennifer, in another case, I would agree with you, except I know that this has been looked at by not just Mont McDonald, but three other engineers, excluding r &V. So, I mean, I'm telling you, this has been, I, it's been- can I, can I take exception with, with your point? Mr. Sure. Thornton is an expert in designing these, uh, you know, the, the, the pump station and, uh, you know, this whole system that he's designing. The un other engineers that are involved do not have Mr. Thornton's specialty, okay? So, you know, you can, you can look at it if, um, we all go to a general practitioner uh, as, a, as a doctor, but if we have a, a certain problem, uh, you know, we, suppose you have a heart issue, you go, you go to, a, to a cardiac doctor. And what I'm saying is, is that Mr. Thornton has a specialty and why not have peers of the same specialty take a look at the project? I I'd probably just say, I'd, and, and I do, we are receptive to, you know, review and, and uh, constructive criticism and there, there, there could be ways that, you know, things could be improved. But I, I do think it's important to keep in mind the schedule here. Um, the grant has a pretty hard and fast deadline of when the project's supposed to be done. We're getting ready to submit the permit application with the permit level drawings, like I mentioned. Um, so once the permits are submitted now, if if, if changes are made, you would then have to go back for a permit modification or interrupt that permit review process, which could further delay the start of the project. And you could be getting into some um, very close calls in terms of the construction schedule. Um, I guess one of my other concerns is if, if, a, if a third party is, is reviewing it, but they don't have the authority to change the plans themselves, there, you know, their concerns would would have to be agreed on by the, the, the by Mom McDonald, who's actually signing the plans. Um, so just because someone has an idea doesn't necessarily mean that it's something that you know the signer of the plans would feel comfortable doing. Um, so just just trying to think of you know potential complications that would arise. But again, we're certainly receptive uh, to any you know comments that that or you know, uh, review that could improve the overall project, certainly. Tom, I'm going to assume this, but I assume a lot of things in my life. I understand that you're working with the county and they have professionals. Right. Right? Yes. So add that to our list. Right. Now, of course, that being said, like I said earlier, this is not my decision or one person's decision. So if it's something that the majority wants to see happen, then it's something that we would have to take action on. And I'm not quite sure how we would take action until we know what price we'd be taking action on. And risking losing the grant. So that being said, um, where are you at, Mr. Smith? Somebody give me some guidance here as to what next time we meet is in uh, three weeks. So I'm going to say this again. I feel confident in the unofficial peer review that we have going on right now. Uh, I was a part of it last week. It was 
extensive. We had a lot of conversation. There was back and forth. And I witnessed, um, you know, potential reconciliation between some minor differences. And I think it's going to work out. And I don't think it's going to slow up the process. And, and I don't think the borough needs to spend any more money. And at the end of the day, I think we're all going to feel very confident that the product that is designed is a good one for a lot of different reasons. First, because Mott McDonald designed it. And two, because we have somebody with, uh, with knowledge that has our best interests in mind looking at it. Can I hear from some of the others? Reese, uh, Frank? I concur. I think, you know, if I'm not so concerned with the deadline, I think that can be managed, that we still fall within the time frame of the grant. That's that's not of a concern to me. Um, but I do feel that that um, Mr. Thornton's firm is of such a high caliber that I I feel very comfortable with his representation of of the borough and 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 every and every all their fiduciary obligations to the borough. So again, I'm I'm always one to advocate for more information, more understanding of the issue. Here, uh, I think it's been reviewed and I think it's been vetted properly by Mr. Thornton's firm. And I, at this point, I I, I don't see much benefit. Uh, coming from further review. It, it, Charles, I, I, I'm uh, in agreement with you, uh, especially with this, the situation where um, Bob is intimately involved with a weekly follow up um, and staying, you know, making sure that he is uh, fully engaged with the project also. I think that that's another key aspect of this is making sure that that um, that you know that we make sure we're staying on top of it, and I would think that that would fall on you know mostly with uh, with with Bob and his um, discussions with uh, with Tom and the rest of the group from Mott McDonald. Frank? I'm in agree I'm in agreement with uh, the uh, the group's perspective on uh, Mott McDonald and not uh, not going to an, an additional peer review. Uh, session. Okay. Any more questions for Mr. Thornton? Observations, concerns? Okay. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Tom. So we're going to, did uh, Mr. Bowen come back by any chance for the doc hearing? I'm looking and I do not see him. I'm going to move on and maybe he'll show up. Um, communications. Clerk, do we have any communications? Yes, Mayor. I have a um, letter to be read into the record. Um, it's uh, Dear Mayor Davies Dunhauer. I write in response to Tuesday's, and it, this is from uh, Councilman Dallahan. I write in response to Tuesday council, council meeting where council member Josie Rich was accused of behavior I do not believe is true. Once accused, the charge will never go away. I have no idea who was behind accusing Josie in this manner. I have known her for years and believe she is a good person who would never behave in the manner claimed by Mr. Bunting's letter. Such behavior does not pass the test of reasonableness given her long service and record of positive contributions to the borough. Mr. Bunting's letter has the truth of the story when he states the electric wires were pulling off the building, creating both the physical danger of falling on someone and a fire hazard. In such an instance, it seems to me both the police and the fire department should have been asked to be there at the scene to protect pedestrians, vehicles, and direct traffic. In my opinion, this is a man management failure on the part of M Town Square not to have informed the proper authorities of the danger and requested police and fire department protection and supervision. It is also my opinion that it was totally irresponsible for Atlantic City Electric to leave the scene knowing the possible danger to pedestrians and property. If the situation were as dire as Mr. Bunting claims, 
Why didn't AC Electric call the fire department? Mr. Bunting's letter is based on hearsay. Who is this individual claiming to have heard Mrs. Rich and instructed them not to do the work? Who are the other witnesses who claim to have heard the conversation? Mrs. Rich was actually on the scene. Mr. Bunting was not. Mrs. Rich is owed a public apology for this unsubstantiated attack on her good name and character. I ask this letter be read at the next council meeting on June 16th for the record. Can I have a motion accepting the correspondence from Councilman Dallahan and making it part of the record? So moved. Can I make that motion? Yes, so moved. I need a second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Do you have any other communications? No, Mary, that's all. May I have a motion concerning the minutes? Madam Mayor, since all members of council have been provided with a copy of the minutes of the work session and the meeting of May 19th, 2020, and the work session and regular meeting of June 2nd, 2020, if there are no additional additions or corrections, I move we dispense with the reading of the minutes and that they be approved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. We'll now have public comment. Anyone wishing to address mayor and council may do so at this time by raising their hand electronically. If you're on the meeting via video, click on the appropriate location. If you're participating via telephone, please hit star nine. When called upon, you will state your name and address for the record. Please make sure to mute your device after your question is answered. To mute your device, you will need to hit star six. So I'm looking for anyone raising their hand, both at me at the screen or electronically. Jennifer, do you see anybody? No. Okay, seeing no one, I shall close public comment. Ordinance 1569. Madam Mayor, I move that Ordinance 1569 be taken up on second reading. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Will the clerk read the title only of Ordinance 1569 on second reading? An ordinance amending Chapter 134, the revised general ordinances, adding an exception. The public hearing on Ordinance 1569 is open. I'm looking through those who are still with us. The public hearing is now closed. Madam Mayor, I move that Ordinance 1569 be passed on second reading and advance to third and final reading. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. I'm sorry? Yes. Mr. Kefchek? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Abstain? Will the clerk read the title only of Ordinance 1569 on third and final reading? An ordinance amending Chapter 134, the revised general ordinances, adding an exception. Madam Mayor, I move that Ordinance 1569 be passed on third and final reading, adopted and published according to law. Second. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mr. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchek? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Abstain. Resolution 2020-S-125. Mayor and Council, I offer Resolution 2020-S-125 for adoption. Second. Uh, this is a uh, an amendment. I had to find the right one. This is a, an amendment to the uh, contract for rebuilding the beach ADA accesses. It decreases the amount of the contract by 29,407. 
We like decreases. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mr. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchuk? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020 S126. Parent Council, I offer Resolution 2020-S-126 for adoption. Second. This is uh, just to dispose of two pieces of property on Gulf Deals, uh, two pieces from, uh, two pieces of equipment, I should say, not property from Public Works 2015 work boat and a 2010 Ford Explorer. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchuk? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020 S127. Mayor and, <clears throat> Mayor and Council, I offer Resolution 2020 S-127. Second. Is this is a uh, change in status of the um, SLEOs from uh, grade two to grade one for uh, the summer season. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchuk? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020-S-128. I'd like to offer Resolution 2020-S-128 for adoption. Second. Explanation, Josie? Can't hear you. It's for the fees for the street openings that were not used to be refunded. And discussion? Could you hear that? Yes. Okay. Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchuk? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020-S-129. Madam Mayor and Council, I present Resolution 2020-S-129 uh, to okay. refund and cancel the taxes of totally disabled veteran Hilbert T. Steltz, who's disabled as a result of wartime service. And we thank you, Mr. Steltz, for your service. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Ms. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchuk? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020-S-130. Madam Mayor and Council, I offer Resolution 2020-S-130 for adoption. Second. Uh, this resolution is to appoint uh, James Kraft as the uh, fund commissioner and Kate McGonigal as the alternate fund um, commissioner for the Atlantic County Municipal uh, Joint Insurance Fund. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchuk? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. <clears throat> Resolution 2020-S-131. Mayor and Council, I offer Resolution 2020-S-131. Second. Adoption. This is for the purchase of a uh, 2020 uh, Chevrolet Silverado crew cab to replace a uh, vehicle in the fire department that uh, I believe was uh, originally uh, launched in 2006. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? 
Yes. Mr. Belichick? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020-S-132. Madam Mayor and Council, I offer Resolution 2020-S-132 for adoption. Second. Uh, this is for approval for the uh, professional services of de Blasio and Associates to prepare a stormwater system master plan and flood mitigation for the borough at a cost of $54,000. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchuk? Yes. Senator Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020-S-133. Mayor and Council, I offer Resolution 2020 S133. This is for the li liquor license renewal for Shelter Haven. We need a second. Any discussion? Yeah, I, I, had, I just have one question. I don't know whether anybody can answer it, but um, this, in, in a couple different places, it refers to newly licensed areas. What are the newly licensed areas? I mean, these are usually just renewals, right? And are they, um, and I don't know, is, is it buckets? Yeah. Stuff like one, that and, and the pizza pub? One was, yeah, as they went down the street, it was buckets and then it was the pizza pub and it was at one time the deck in the back also. Okay, so it's, it's okay. nothing that we don't already know about. No, it's nothing that's new. Yeah, correct. It's yes, correct. Did we call the roll? Okay, clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Krafchek? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020-S-134. I'd like to offer uh, for resolution 2020 S 134 for adoption. Second. This is to refund beach tags to Mrs. Staley. I believe she bought 12 and didn't realize she did and she bought another 12. So now she'd like refund for 12. Any discussion? Clerk call the roll. Mr. Dallahan. Yes. Mrs. Gensimer. Yes. Mr. Kravchuk. Yes. Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020-S-136. Madam Mayor and Council, I present Resolution 2020-S-135. Uh, it's a duplicate order for beach tags uh, from Mrs. Oh, Larned. Second. And discussion? That was 135, so I screwed up. So that was S-135. I got the second. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchuk? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. I was distracted by the sunset. It's very pretty. <laughs> it's been a long meeting. <laughs> Resolution 2020-S-136. Madam Mayor, I offer Resolution 2020-S-136 for adoption. Second. This resolution uh, authorizes an amendment to our, out, uh, to our 10th ordinance authorizing the zoning officer to approve at his discretion 10th uh, in conjunction with outdoor dining related to COVID-19. Any discussion? I'm not sure. I have, I have a point to make. I'm not okay. sure that I like the idea of tents being used in connection with outdoor dining. I understand, I understand umbrellas and an umbrella covering 
a table, but a tent, it seems to me, is a step too far. Okay, any more discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Could I just ask a question? Sure. This is, this is just during the COVID, right? Yeah. This is temporary. Yes. This is just during COVID-19. As soon as restrictions are lifted by the state, any of these restrictions would then be null and void. I'm sorry, any of these um, permissions would be null and void. And that, does this mean that they can go up on 96th Street? No, they, this is particularly to, for, for those who are using their parking lots. There's been two applications that have asked no, I'm wrong. One so far that says for a tent. Any more discussion? Clark, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kapchak? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. Mrs. Rich? Yes. Resolution 2020-S137. Uh, Madam Mayor and Council, uh, I offer resolution 2020-S-137. This is the authorization for the award of contracts for extraordinary unspecifiable services for Stone Harbor for the summer of 2020. Second. Any discussion? Clerk, call the roll. Mr. Dallahan? Yes. Mrs. Gensimer? Yes. Mr. Kravchuk? Yes. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Parzik? Yes. This is Rich? Yes. We have no items of discussion on regular meeting agenda. Um, I have a, just a short report bringing everybody up to date on a couple of items. To start with, as I always do with my report, I want to thank all the borough employees for another two weeks of professionalism and commitment to their jobs. As we're all aware, it, um, as soon as it appears things might be settling in, another change comes along. Our employees continue to roll with those changes and continue to do a great job. All employees began working their normal hours this morning. After two weeks of engaging the public by appointment, borough employees are now gearing up to have Borough Hall open to the public officially through the front, front door on Monday, June 22nd. The administrators advise the department heads and employees of what protocols must be put in place, including daily temperature checks and face coverings when unable to maintain the recommended six foot distance from others. Council members and professionals who do not work in Borough Hall every day are reminded to have a face covering on when you enter Borough Hall to protect both yourself and our employees and visitors. Remember, we're gonna be going back to where you turn a corner and there's gonna be somebody there once that front door is open. We're asking all those who do come into Borough Hall to conduct your business and keep socializing to a minimum. And of course, a face covering is required to be worn by the public. Yesterday, New Jersey eased into phase two of recovery. Retail stores can now have shoppers inside and our outdoor dining began. This is a day that's long been awaited, not just by business owners, but residents, vacationers, visitors, all the citizens of New Jersey. We all know this has been a spring like no other. Our business community is an integral part of Stone Harbor and one of the things that sets us apart from other towns. We can all now enjoy what the business district has to offer and help our businesses get back on their feet. I took a ride around town yesterday I saw many restaurants set up for outdoor dining and lots of those tables had patrons. Special thanks to our construction and zoning official, Ray Poudrier for a lot of hard work getting these permits done and police chief Shutter who worked with him to get all the outdoor dining applications approved and their businesses operational. Several restaurants are still in the process of applying for permits. At this time, there is still no indication from the governor when indoor dining will be permitted. In addition to changes in retail and restaurant openings, there's been significant changes made to recreation and athletic programs beginning June 22nd. While increasing the number of programs and permitted activities that are taking place, protocols also increase that must be followed to keep everyone safe and healthy as we start to interact again with one another. 
I'm asking those who participate in our programs to be both patient and cooperative as the Recreation Department carefully reviews the mandates of the New Jersey Department of Health that were issued just yesterday and structuring programs accordingly. It's still early in the summer. We're getting a lot of our programming back. We just are gonna need people to be patient and cooperative. Tina, the Recreation Director, met with JT, Jonathan Lacoste, the uh, Office of Emergency Management Coordinator, to go over those EUSs that we just approved, that you just approved, to make sure that the protocols are in place and that all those programming and camps are safe and that they also adhere to executive orders. Um, just one last thing, this morning we received encouraging news on the weekly coronavirus task force call with the Cape May County Health Department. There is seven cases of COVID-19 in Cape Regional. Cape Urgent Care is conducting 110 tests per day. This week, the health department reported a 2% positivity rate on those tests. Three weeks ago, that positivity rate was 10%. And although this news is all good, the county health officer did remind us that there were 10 deaths due to COVID last week. He cautioned us that we need to continue to keep our guard up. The virus is still here and we need to remain careful and follow protocols. Um, JT is on duty, I believe, at the firehouse. He said he has nothing additional to report. So anybody have any questions for me? Any comments on the report? Need any further information? Then may I have a motion approving the bill list? Madam Mayor, I approve. I move that we approve the bill list and authorize the CFO to pay the bills when the funds are available and the vouchers properly endorsed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. <clears throat> Aye. Opposed? Just uh, when you thought it was time to end the meeting, Mr. Bowen apparently has joined us again. Are you there, Frank? I think, Frank, are you under Vanessa? I think I see you. Yeah, that, that's my understanding, that's Vanessa. Frank? There he is. He's connecting to the audio. All right, I'm here. So you're here for a doc hearing, correct? Yeah. <laughs> you guys forgot about Where it. you been? We didn't forget. You left. <laughs> well, you always make me first, so I'm spoiled now, okay? <laughs> no, you just had to sit through the longest work session in the history of the Bar of Stone Harbor. I it going that way so I was like all right we'll do this another time <laughs> so what we will do is mr. caravan are you here to start? I am. are you ready to handle that you thought you were done too well you're not <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand do you swear to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth I do would you state your name for the record Frank Bowen. Okay, Mr. Bowen, would you please tell the council about this application? I'm going to, I read it earlier. I'm going to bring it up for my uh, recall because I don't have it in front of me, but I'm pretty, uh, pretty good with it. Do you guys have any copies of it at all? We do. We were provided with copies. Okay. So you'll see some shaded areas like in the front of the pier, and there's an, a box with an arrow that says uh, remove three foot or section of pier and remove lower section and build a floating dock. So what's going on here is the structure is non-conforming and the gentleman wants to make it conforming. So he went to the DEP, got his permit. They told him what to do in that drawing is what he has to do to make it conform. So basically we're removing those structures, adding that little floating dock, and then he will conform. Anybody have any questions of Mr. Bowen? Need any clarification? 
I just have a question because I'm looking at the permit. Um, this talks about, yes, yes, you're doing the bulkhead and you're also doing, oh, where'd it go? Uh, three boat lifts? No. No, not in Stone Harbor. Um, <laughs> there's, uh, there's a boat lift there, but I don't think anything happens to the boat lift. It's, I think it set, maybe mentions it in the permit, but I'm not, I'm not aware of that part of it. Well, the bottom part where it says description authorized activities, the last um, sentence, maybe I'm reading it wrong, legalize the existing 13 by 13 open boat lift. Yeah, that's the lift that's moorings. there. That's the lift that's there. And he's, he's on the side of town where you guys allow boat lifts in that commercial northern end of town. Yeah, it's it, been there for years. It, it's talking about uh, three pilings, Josie, three additional pilings. What's, what's it say? I see the 13 by 13 open boat lift. That's and a that's boat lift with four pilings. Legalize the existing 13 by 13 open boat lift and three mooring piles. Okay, so the 13 by 13 Boat lift is the boat lift that's there right now. I guess the, the, the footprint of it is a 13 by 13 square, you know, 13 feet by 13 feet. And there's probably three mooring pilings that are there to moor the boat from the float. That's what they're talking about. So is it your testimony that basically these are all pre-existing conditions and you are merely seeking to legalize them with this application? Yes. Any more questions? Okay. So I then need a motion to approve the doc permit for 9301 Sunset. We want to ask if oh. there's anyone to speak for or against. Oh, okay. Is there anybody here to speak for or against this application? Let me check through. Everybody left. I guess they didn't want to hear me. <laughs> I don't see anyone speaking for or against. So now, Marcus, should I make ask for the motion? You can close the that portion and move on. Okay, I'll, I'll close that portion of the hearing. And now I need a motion approving the dock permit application for 9301 Sunset Drive by Channel Marine. So move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Worth waiting for there, Mr. Bowen. I appreciate the phone call so late. <laughs> and thanks for all your hard work, because you guys are working hard over there, especially with all this crap going on, right? Yeah. Thank you. I'm have having a good night. Fine, I recommend you go have one, too. <laughs> <laughs> At least one. <laughs> <laughs> all right. You're um, good? You're good. All right, We're going to close this party. <laughs> All right. Go home. Um, I got one more public comment. Anyone wishing to address mayor and council may do so at this time by raising their hand electronically. If you're on the meeting via video, click on the appropriate location. If you're participating via telephone, please hit star nine. When called upon, you would say your name and for the record. Please make sure to mute your device after your question is answered. To mute your device, you will need to hit star six. Sir. Oh, I see a hand raised. Patty. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good Thank evening. You. I'll try to make this very quick. This is the longest meeting known to man. I would be remiss if I didn't congratulate Mayor and Council on the work that's being done on 93rd and 94th Street. As a resident of 93rd Street and a summer resident of 94th Street, I have watched this project from the first application somewhere in 2017. I don't know when I've seen more engineers, surveyors. The street looks like Peter Max with all the different colors of lines and stuff everywhere. I don't know how we could bring anybody else in to do any more oversight, spend any more money, and delay the project any longer. Thank you for all you've done. Plus, the guys who have been doing this job are the most phenomenal crew of workers we've ever encountered in this town. 
and I've watched them for a really long time. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Nice to get good news. Is there anyone else who would like to address mayor and council? Mayor, Madam me. Mayor, uh, yes. I have a question for you. I just uh, received a communication and uh, I need to ask you about the open container rule for restaurants. When are restaurants allowed to uh, have BYOB? Effective immediately. Okay. And the BYOB does, it includes beer, wine, and I believe it's malt liquor only. Okay, thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. And yes. If I, if I could just say one more thing. Um, I, I would just really like to commend the construction office. They worked long hours and uh, this over the past week to get all of our restaurants up and going with their plans for uh, outdoor dining and it's up and up and running and it's very successful and our sidewalks are filled with diners and it was a lot of hard work. Even the state, the uh, ABC worked the weekend for, uh, for us. So we really appreciate it. Yes, good work. All right, Bonnie Porzik, you're on. I just wanted to commend everyone, mayor, council, administration, for a spectacular four hour meeting. Where else can you hear how the borough actually works and reveal the kind of work that's done behind the scenes? You all need to be commended. I'm so proud to be in a borough that works so hard for the people and then shows it off in this very long meeting for anyone who cares to listen. So thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Have a good night. Okay. Can we please all go home now? Does anybody else want to address mayor and council? I'm going to flip through. I love how Patty actually used the little hand. I think it's the first time I've seen it. Okay, I don't see anybody. I think all that's left is a motion to adjourn. Stand by. So moved. Yep. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? <laughs> Have a good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thank you.